So welcome everyone to tonight's virtual meeting of the Port Phillip City Council. Uh, the City of Port Phillip respectfully acknowledges the Yalakabulam clan of the Bunurong and traditional owners of the other lands we meet from today. We pay our respects to their elders, both past and present. We acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. So due to the current COVID-19 restrictions, tonight's meeting is being held via the WebEx platform and streamed via Council's webcast page and Facebook Live. Whilst we have planned for this online meeting, there is always the risk of technical issues arising that are beyond our control. And if we do experience these technical difficulties, we will adjourn the meeting for a short time to resolve the issue. And if we can't, and the meeting cannot continue, we will adjourn to a later date and the details will be circulated as early as possible. So all the submissions from members of the public will be heard at the start of the meeting. Additionally, voting on all motions will be under division, where the chair will call upon councillors individually in rotating alphabetical order to state their vote. I do remind attendees that any member of the public addressing council must extend due courtesy and respect to council and the processes under which it operates and must take direction from the chair whenever called on to do so. Speakers must remain respectful and statements or questions must not be defamatory, offensive or objectionable aimed at embarrassing a councillor or a member of council staff or relate to a matter outside the powers of the council. Councillors, uh, the first agenda item is apologies. Do we have any apologies tonight? There being none, we'll move on to item number two, which is the minutes of the previous meetings. So councillors, the minutes of the ordinary meeting held on the 2nd of June, 2021, and the special meeting held on the 8th of June, 2021 have been circulated. Are there any questions regarding these minutes? If not, can I have a motion to confirm these minutes? If I to put my chat on, then that would be handy, wouldn't it? Now, Councillor Baxter to move and Councillor Mark, uh, Pearl to second. Uh, I will now put the motion under division and call upon each councillor for your vote. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond? Four. Councillor Clark? Four. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford? Four. Councillor Consolo? Four. Councillor Martin? Four. Sorry, Councillor Martin, I couldn't quite hear you. Four. Was that there? Four. I can see your mouth moving. It's very, very hard to hear you. Sorry. Councillor Pearl? In favour. I can hear you. Great. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Thank you. The motion is carried. Uh, item three is declaration of conflicts of interest. Does anyone have a conflict of interest in a matter being discussed at tonight's meeting? Um, I do, Madam Mayor, if I could read that out for you. Y yes, please. So I, Councillor Pell, have a general interest in confidential report 18.1, JLT class action, due to association with a party to the matter, I'll remove myself um, from the meeting at that point in time when the report's considered. Thank you, Councillor Pearl. I also um, will declare a conflict of interest. I have a potential perceived interest in report 10.1, a tender award, which is the provision of civil infrastructure maintenance services due to an association with a tenderer. At the time of this report, I will remove myself from the meeting and request that the Deputy Mayor assumes the chair. Uh, all right, we're moving on to public question time and submissions. We will now hear all the public questions and comments on the report items from members of the public. All the requests to speak were required to be submitted by 4 p.m. this afternoon. So firstly, I will call upon Catherine Bramwell, who is submitting a public question. Catherine, are you there? Catherine? All right, we'll move on to Jan Cossa also submitting a public question. Jan, are you with us? Uh, yes, I am. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Jan, could you state your name and suburb and then you've got three minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Jan Fossa, Middle Park. Thank you, councillors. I listened with great interest last week to budget submissions pre presented at the council meeting, although I confess I went to bed at 10.45. It was inspiring to hear the level of community care, passion and support for small budget community programs 
that aim to build our community cohesion and well-being. At a time when income and wealth inequality is increasing across Australia, as reported by the New University of New South Wales report 2020, it is impressive to see the range of social and psychological initiatives being proposed. To get a fuller sense of community priorities from your 21-22 budget community consultations, could you please advise the total numbers for and against the proposed increases or cuts to community services and programs from all online surveys, written submissions and speakers at council meeting last week. I look forward to this data with thanks, Jan. Thanks, Jan. Um, I think Kylie Bennett might answer that now. Uh, through you, Mayor, um, firstly, I'd like to thank Jan Kossar for her questions. Our community engagement comprised of an online survey that sought feedback on the proposed service changes of the draft budget, along with inviting community, community submissions. And we also had a comprehensive neighbourhood engagement activity. Uh, we received a total of 376 survey responses and 553 community submissions. And I understand there were about 90 uh, people who uh, were planning to or did address the council last week. Uh, the survey sought the level of agreement and asked respondents to what extent they agreed or disagreed with the proposed service change. In relation to the proposed service change around Sport Phillip and community programs, uh, the results indicated that 98 of the 376 respondents, or around 26%, either strongly agreed or agreed with the proposed service change, while 197 of the 376, uh, so that it's about 52%, either disagreed or strongly disagreed. There were a further 74 respondents that provided a neutral response and seven chose not to respond to the question. Uh, we also received a further five community submissions indicating um, their uh, concerns with the reduction of the service. With respect to the 1.5% rate increase, I understand we received 35 community submissions opposing a rate increase and 11 submissions supporting the proposed uh, rate increase. Of the speakers who spoke at last uh, week's council meeting, uh, I understand, but we might just check this, uh, that there were four people who were opposed uh, to the rates that had not provided a formal submission. Um, I'm unable to advise if any of the speakers at last week's meeting had participated in the survey as we don't collect their names, but we might just um, provide some further clarity around the submissions uh, and speakers at, at the last council meeting. Thank you, Kylie. Um, I call on Phil Edmonds uh, speaking to item 7.1, which is the petitions and joint letters. Phil, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. If you could state your name and suburb and then please speak. Uh, so my name is Phil Edmonds and I'm from South Melbourne. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I just wanted to speak briefly in relation to the petitions that were received regarding the intersection, bridge, Glover uh, and Pickles. And just to make a few points in relation to those, um, they characterised in the papers as two opposing and one in favour. In fact, I think properly characterised, there's one fully in favour of the proposal that had been put to um, residents. There's one that is mostly in favour, but wants a change that is no right, uh, that is preserving a right turn into Bridge Street from Pickles. And then there is one that is opposing. In relation to the largest of those petitions, the 158 signature one, effectively what they said is, please preserve a right turn uh, into bridge from uh, Pickles. That could be achieved by just slightly changing what is proposed. At the moment, what's proposed is that the median go all the way across. In fact, you could just extend it half the way across and you could just have a left turn out of Glover only. And I don't know if this is with um, 
uh, councillors, but I put in a little diagram indicating what how that uh, could occur. Um, and that would be effectively on all fours with what's asked for by those 158. It obviously wouldn't go as far as the ones who were totally in support, which is the 63, but it would go most of the way. So that would really be favoured, I think, uh, you know, uh, by 221 of the uh, signatures. And then there is the petition, which is 45 against. If that um, proposal were put in place, um, it's only a slight variation to what's proposed, has been proposed um, by the traffic department, and it would still uh, prevent um, some of the other complicated um, and dangerous uh, movements, which is all the way through from Glover to Bridge and Bridge to Glover over very busy pickles, and the right turn from Glover into pickles, the right turn from Bridge into pickles. The only issue, I guess, in relation to that is I think that the traffic department might say, well, in terms of the accidents that have occurred, they have um, more predominantly been, in fact, that right turn from Pickles into Bridge. And that, I guess, based on the figures in terms of reported accidents is no doubt true. I guess the submission would be, look, if, if all of those other complicating movements were no longer happening. So the only sort of cross movement uh, was that right turn from Pickles into Bridge, then that would inherently make that safer. And so I guess I'm saying, look, I think that there is a preponderant uh, support for that slight variation. And I, I spoke to, or I was the person behind the 63 signature petition and I spoke to all people. Um, who signed that petition, and I know that there is a view in uh, Bridge that some people would like to be able to turn right into Bridge. Um, so, the Phil, you've actually last... reached, Phil, you've got, uh, you've finished your three minutes, so if you could wrap up um, your... Yes, okay. The only, the, only, the only other point that I would make, just one, one point, is that the primary issue here is safety. Most of the submissions aren't really responsive to safety. They really talk about convenience and traffic flows. Um, my submission would be uh, the variation, or if not the variation, then it's only a test. Um, if traffic says for the safety, you have to have the median right across, safety should trump the other considerations, and it is, after all, only a test. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, I call upon Christopher Fogarty speaking to item 12.1, the amendment C161 port part two, the adoption. Christopher, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, so Christopher, so. I need you to state your name and suburb and then please speak to uh, the item. Christopher John Fogarty, City of Melbourne. Okay, please speak, sir. I am uh, just wanted to make a couple of quick points about the uh, heritage overlay um, and the, the part H0512, uh, which is being considered tonight. My interest is in part H0512 as a, an owner of one of the dilapidated flats in um, 58 to 60 Queens Road. Um, I have followed this very carefully. I've presented to council previously. I've presented to the planning uh, uh, panel. I just wanted to make some two points. The vast majority of supporters of this part of the overlay who've agitated for its adoption are in fact residents or owners of apartments on St Kilda Road, specifically the Eve Apartments. And development of the flats of which I'm one owner at 56 to 60 Queens Road would potentially obstruct the view that they have of Albert Park and Port Phillip Bay. There has been a massive and expensive campaign by those residents and owners to effectively hoodwink the planning panel into thinking that they are all of a sudden taken with the drab and dilapidated flats at Queen's Road. I think that this should be considered uh, in the deliberations of the council tonight. The next point I'd like to make is that there is a difference between something being interesting to heritage consultants and being of sufficient importance 
to warrant putting a heritage overlay and effectively banning development. It would have to be of massive importance to prevent 62 faithful ratepayers from um, selling eventually their one investment uh, uh, to um, develop it. I would challenge anybody in, in, the, in this meeting uh, to say that they've even heard the term modern style uh, in relation to the, uh, the architecture of these buildings. The next point, the buildings are approximately, are approaching 80 years old and require constant maintenance. The bill for plumbing in the, in the year 2018-19 was of the order of 20,000. Is it sufficient of sufficient importance architecturally that we owners are required to prop up these deteriorating drab buildings forever? Finally, um, we, we do have a commitment as a community to provide adequate new housing in inner Melbourne to meet the needs of our growing population. I, I submit that these buildings are not of sufficient importance to warrant uh, applying the heritage overlay. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. Uh, I call upon Joe Plummer speaking to item 12.2, which is the South Melbourne Market Strategic Plan 2021-2025 for endorsement. Joe, are you with us tonight? I am indeed. Thank a you tough so much. A tough day for the market. Indeed. Um, so I'll, I'll hopefully chat to that at the end. But certainly um, on behalf of the South Melbourne Market Specially, Special Advisory Committee, we would like to thank you for obviously giving us this opportunity to present the strategic plan for 21-25 yeah. through to you for endorsement. Now, Joe, um, if you could I just state your name and suburb before we go out, before you head down the... <laughs> I certainly can. It. Thank Joanne you. Joanne Plummer, uh, suburb 3215. Great. Um, so the, the market itself needs no introduction, nor do you need to know just how important um, it is to the community and as an iconic um, piece and fabric of the South Melbourne area. So with that said, um, what I would like to do is just say to you that the uh, our advisory committee um, provides this roadmap for the next five years, which you have seen in a number of different iterations. Uh, and we certainly believe that this will put the market in the best position to tackle the challenges ahead. And we each know what they are. It certainly outlines the key strategic priorities for the committee and the management team to achieve alongside business as usual, which is no mean feat. Um, and also to lay the foundations for a bright and prosperous future for the market, its traders, the local economy, and of course, the community, um, which is incredibly important. Uh, it will build and continue to build a trusting and loyal customer base, which we know is incredibly important. Um, and that joyful, safe and rewarding experience that we have come to expect every single interaction that we have. Importantly, it will also address the impact the market has on ratepayers um, with respect to the financial sustainability of its operations. The final program of community and trader consultation has occurred through the draft strategic plan. And this was undertaken in May and we received lots of really terrific feedback, which we have also taken into consideration. Um, and that has been put um, into the final version of the strategic plan. Uh, this included um, that the market is and should remain very much loved, um, that it is it continues to be accessible, um, that it does not become gentrified and that we must continue to address and continuously improve the congestion um, that we know is a problem going forward. We're also confident that this plan and its implementation over the next five years will deliver on the community and trader aspirations and ensure we future proof as much as we possibly can um, the iconic community assets so that it's viable for the future. Um, you'll be certainly sure that we will continue to listen to the community and the traders as we continue to 
it, um, improve the market and certainly we will seek expert advice throughout the journey um, to ensure that we're able to provide the best possible uh, public impact. So with that said, we hand that over to you and I would also very briefly just like to acknowledge and thank the incredible efforts of the market team and in particular Danielle for the work they did with the COVID incident um, overnight. Thank you very much, Jo, and thanks to all the team. Uh, I now call on Travis Atkins speaking to item 12.1, amendment to C161 Port Part 2 adoption. Uh, thank you, councillors. Can presume you can hear me okay? We can, Travis, if you want to state your name and, and suburb and, and please speak to the item. Thank you, Travis Atkins, St Kilda Sea Bars, St Kilda. Um, for those that I haven't met, thank you uh, for your time. Um, just speaking to the heritage overlay, um, just uh, I know that the independent review put that uh, St Kilda Sea Bars had an option to have a social impact on heritage review. From our perspective, particularly at the moment, business is uh, struggling. Um, people are potentially losing homes, uh, and I won't go through the sob story, which you've all heard. We're trying to do everything we can to survive, um, and uh, we are probably one of the most heavily, heavily regulated complexes in the country. Um, we would desperately uh, not want to see any upgrading of the heritage value, considering there is none, as advised by the council's own heritage advisor that there's no heritage value whatsoever on the current sea bars because it was rebuilt. Um, so our regulations um, make it near impossible to do much as it is. Having another regulation that we need to spend time, money and resource would limit our ability to improve the amenity uh, for the future. So um, we'd just like to express that position to you all. Thank you, Travis. I'm now calling on James Woollett speaking to item 13.1, the Library Action Plan uh, for Council endorsement. Uh, James, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, James, please um, state your name and suburb and, and then please speak to the item. My name is James Woollett. I live in Middle Park and I am a member of the Middle Park Library Action Group. I refer you to item 13.1 on today's agenda, Council Endorsement Library Action Plan. After over three years of work by the various external consultants, council managers and library officers, we're delighted to see the plan reach this stage. Nevertheless, we're deeply concerned that the plan that you have been asked to endorse tonight is deeply flawed. Plan proposes a large number of actions, quote, that will be implemented over the next five years, close quote, from programming to performance spaces, from creative development to climate emergency relief centers, to name but a few. All these may well be excellent activities for council to support. Unfortunately, the authors of the plan have not indicated priorities, a timetable, or costs of implementation. Without this information, the plan is merely a list of aspiration. Without an enormous increase in space and capital required to accommodate these proposals, the quantity and quality of hard copy books in libraries, and at Middle Park Library in particular, will have to be massively reduced. Excuse me. Port Phillip Council's actions over the last four years do not inspire confidence that it believes in the importance of books and literacy. And for example, the decision to remove all the books from Middle Park Library in 2017, the $200,000 cut to the purchasing budget for books and children, the attempt earlier this year to remove book clubs from the libraries, the reference on page 20 of the appendix to the draft library action plan, quote, to reduce per capita stock on the library floor, end of quote. Therefore, we request that you do two things tonight. First, instruct your officers to prepare a budget report with a list of priorities, timelines, and estimated costs for the proposed actions. The report to be completed for councillors review by the second council meeting in July of this year. Second, 
Amend today's motion to read. Build a high quality and contemporary hard copy and digital collection that increases the number of hard copy books available for adults and children. This collection will reflect the community's diverse and, emergency, uh, and emerging needs. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, I now call on Michael Sabata speaking to item 13.1, uh, the Library Action Plan. Michael, are you online? Through you, Mayor, Michael Sabata has been unable to attend this evening, so I will read a statement on his behalf, which reads, I express concern with this report. Without a significant increase in space and capital to accommodate all of the proposals, the inventory and quality of physical books at Port Phillip Libraries will be downgraded and likely to hit services at Middle Park and Emerald Hill branches the hardest, as has been the case in the past. The vulnerability of the library service collection has been compounded by one, the $200,000 cut to the library's budget to purchase books for children and adult, adults. Two, the attempt to withdraw support from book clubs. Three, the previous council's 2017 decision to remove books from Middle Park Library. And four, the reduction in stock when previous changes have been made. I would like to request that as a minimum, councillors amend the recommendation to read, build a high quality and contemporary hard copy and digital collection that increases the number of hard copy books available for adults and children. This collection will be built by responding to diverse and emerging community needs. The plan does not indicate priorities among the many proposals it contains. Prior to approving this plan, councillors should instruct the council officers to prepare a report with a list of priorities, timelines and estimated costs for the actions proposed. End of statement. Thank you. Uh, I can now call on Martine Letts speaking to item 14.5 strategic memberships review. Martine, are you there? Good evening. Yes, Lord Mayor, I am. My Welcome. name is Martine Letts and my postcode is 3121. Great. If you could speak to the item, please. Thank you so much, Lord Mayor, and thank you for the opportunity to once again speak to Council today. We at the Committee for Melbourne have worked very hard to build a good collaboration with the City of Port Phillip over the years and ensure that your interests are heard via our forums and advocacy. You are a key foundation member helping deliver the committee's mission of shaping Melbourne's future. Our unique strengths are cross sectoral membership and providing a non-political sounding board for greater Melbourne's challenges in livability, future economy, infrastructure and sustainability. These are all issues we know are very important also to the city of Port Phillip. This cross sectoral strength is also our greatest vulnerability. We receive no money from government. And without our members, we can't carry out our mission at all. We were created 36 years ago, uh, the last time Melbourne had a serious crisis in the mid 1980s to help government, business and labour resume dialogue and implement successful recovery projects. COVID-19 is the biggest crisis for Melbourne since then. Our members and stakeholders say that the committee and its nonpartisan advocacy for Greater Melbourne are more necessary than ever. And the voice of councils and councillors is increasingly important in these discussions, also for your ratepayers. Governments from all jurisdictions now involve us in COVID-19 recovery consultations, including rebuilding Greater, Greater Melbourne and learning from COVID. We have a full calendar to the end of the year with federal and state ministers and shadows whom councillors can access as committee members. For some, the rejuvenation of the non-CBD jurisdiction is a happy COVID consequence. We've hosted discussions on securing that advantage for jurisdictions like Port Phillip. Other advocacy issues where you need to stay at the table include Fisherman's Bend and the absence of serious government investment in crucial transport access, our digital economy and digital skills deficit, the housing affordability crisis, and the need for an integrated transport plan. Collaboration and pooling ideas in these times is more critical than ever. And we want to better connect council and you as individual councillors to our unique network of proud Melburnians who share a passion for the city through your continued membership. Thank you. Thank you, Martine. Uh, I now call upon Councillor Lambros-Tapinos 
uh, President of VLGA, who's speaking to item 14.5, the Strategic Membership Review. Hi, Lambros. Hi, um, I believe Councillor Denise Masood is actually speaking on behalf of the VLGA tonight. Ah, okay. But, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry about that, Lambros. Oh, I'll call no on problem. Councillor Denise Masood but, um, instead. I'm here and, and, I'm here and um, Steve Cooper, the VLGA Chief of Staff, is also here if councillors have any questions. Okay, great. So, Denise, are you there with us? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mayor. Would you state your name and suburb and then please speak away? My name is Councillor Denise Masood. I am in Forest Hill in the eastern suburbs. Um, Mayor and councillors, thank you for this opportunity to share with you the benefits of VLGA activities to support both the sector and your council as a member of the VLGA. VLGA is an independent governance organisation supporting councils, both officers and councillors, in achieving the highest standards of governance on behalf of their communities. Our work enables, promotes and facilitates trust and confidence in the sector. Recent Royal Commissions such as financial services, aged care and integrity agency reports and also regular newspaper headlines show good governance is the biggest game in town. Worldwide trends show there is low trust in government and councils achieve their social licence to operate and the respect of their communities through good governance. As you're aware, we offer networking, information exchange, professional development activities. We actively engage with key policymakers and broad stakeholders to inform, influence and lead the conversations that determine the priorities for the local government sector. We marshal thought leadership and utilise high calibre panels of professionals across a wide variety of topics. We have convened two global CEO live panels and our panel discussion on complex issues are readily accessible to members. Our feedback indicates that councillors and officers do access the online resources regularly and we have risen to the challenge of COVID adapting our service offering to be very accessible. This has provided many VLGA Connect sessions, in fact, in excess of 100, and also highly valued member only online sessions. Being independent, we are engaged and sought after as a peak body to have a seat at the table, particularly in forums, think tanks, advisory committees convened by government, academic institutions, and other lead agencies. We support inclusion and diversity in our programs. Importantly, VLGA offers a free confidential governance advisory service for councillors and officers of our member councils. This service is well used by councils across the state. VLGA is a lean organisation that relies on its membership, offering extraordinary value to the sector in a space not addressed elsewhere. At a broader level, Support for good governance throughout the sector is critical to public trust and continued effective delivery of the important outputs of councils. The continuation and growth of the services I have described is essential to Port Phillip and councils across the state. Without member support of the VLGA, capacity around good governance and programs, these activities may be lost. They are not happening elsewhere. I note that you have two councillors who recently have registered for our Leading the Agenda internal audit session in July. We appreciate your support and we look forward to continuing the work together with you in this important mission. Thank you, that's the end of my statement. Thanks, Councillor Masood. Uh, so Steve, I'm just, just gonna check, you don't need to speak. It was just Denise speaking on behalf of all three. Um, that's correct, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I'll now call on Dominique Lafontaine, speaking to item 14.5, Strategic Memberships Review. Hello, um, can you hear me? It's, yes. Hello, I'm Dominique Lafontaine, uh, postcode 3207, Garden City, and I'm the Executive Officer of the South East Council's Climate Change Alliance, and speaking to you tonight uh, in support of City of Port Phillip's uh, continuing membership with, with our organisation. SECRA is an alliance of local governments working collaboratively to address climate change. Our council members are Bayside Council, Frankston, Mornington Peninsula, Greater Dandenong, Casey, Cardinia, Bass Coast, and of course, currently the, the city of Port Phillip. Our council members recognise the benefits of regional collaboration to address common challenges and issues. 
We know that addressing climate change is a significant priority for our members. And we know that climate change is truly a regional issue. It does not stop at municipal boundaries. Through the collaboration that membership of SECA enables, councils can undertake climate change projects that achieve economies of scale and are stronger because of the knowledge sharing and capacity building uh, that this collaboration supports. Over the past 12 months, one of our key projects is the Asset Vulnerability Assessment Project. Initially, uh, the, co the concept plan initially came from the City of Port Phillip, and the project is mapping the regional impacts of climate change over your council's buildings, local roads and drainage. It, the project's also undertaking case studies to explore a business case for adaptation options, and one of these case studies is focused on the Elwood Foreshore. Another is a region-wide case study looking at the impacts of heat. With the support of Deakin University, SECA has undertaken a review of Member Council's current fleet and future plans and looking at opportunities to transition to 100% Council electric vehicle fleets. And we've just commenced an electric vehicle regional infrastructure roadmap that will be incorporating work already undertaken by the City of Port Phillip to create a truly regional infrastructure strategy. We're working with DELP to shape the Greater Melbourne Regional Adaptation Strategy and ensuring that the challenges that local government faces is high on this strategy's agenda. Together with other regional greenhouse alliances across Victoria, we've made a submission to the Electricity Distribution Price Review, and this has resulted in cost savings for local government and across Victoria and also the City of Port Phillip. We've just been selected by Sustainability Victoria to deliver the Small Business Energy Saver Program, which will make up uh, make up to around $5,000 available to spend on energy efficiency upgrades to approximately 130 businesses in the city of Port Phillip. And we've also commenced a research project that will explore how the planning system in Victoria can be strengthened so that local governments and other relevant decision makers are given the powers to incorporate climate change action in their decisions. With the declaration of climate emergency, local governments recognise the urgency that addressing climate change requires. SECA has advocated for a Victorian emissions reduction target that keeps global temperatures uh, to an increase of 1.5 degrees. And we are also looking to work more closely with the Municipal Association of Victoria to leverage our knowledge and resources and their political connections to advance greater support for local government climate change action from state and federal governments. We've established a councillor advisory group, which enables your councillors uh, and, and those from across our membership to contribute to our strategic direction and assist particularly with advocacy. Membership fees from our nine councils cover the cost of our two and a half staff to run the organisation, manage project delivery, our advocacy and our events. All membership fees are invested into the organisation and we receive no support from state or local governments other than for particular projects if they arrived, if they arrive. As a not-for-profit member-based organisation, our core strength and value proposition is our climate change expertise, our membership and the outcomes that can be achieved through regional collaboration. And we very much look forward to City of Port Phillip continuing its membership with our organisation and enabling that to reap the benefits uh, of those efforts for council and your community. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you. Uh, I call upon Natasha Palik, or is it Palich? I'm not sure, I apologise. I'm speaking to item 14.5, the Strategic Memberships Review. Um, thank you, Mayor. My name is Natasha Palich and I'm based in Thornbury. I thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'd like to acknowledge I'm joining from the lands of the Wurundjeri people and pay my respects to elders and leaders past, present and emerging. I'm the Executive Officer of the Council Alliance for a Sustainable Built Environment known as CASB. I'd like to talk to the value of CASB for the City of Port Phillip. Um, CASB is a member-based organisation of Victorian councils committed to the creation of a sustainable built environment. We currently have 37 Victorian council members, including the City of Port Phillip and we are auspiced by the Municipal Association of Victoria. CASB is self-funded by our members and we also receive no external funding for our work. One of our primary strategic goals is to elevate environmental outcomes in the built environment. We do this through a number of projects, 
one of which is called the Sustainable Design Assessment in the Planning Process Framework. This framework was developed by Victorian councils, including Port Phillip, to provide a streamlined and consistent methodology for requesting, receiving and assessing built environment sustainability outcomes through the planning process. Supporting this framework is the Built Environment Sustainability Scorecard, known as BESS. BESS is a sustainability assessment tool that councils have developed for the development industry to demonstrate how proposed developments meet councils' sustainability expectations. In, in 2019, there were over 4,000 new projects registered in BESS across Victoria, which was an increase of 60% from 2018. And data that we're extracting from the BEST tool it shows that it's being used for a greater variety of building types and in more areas across Victoria. One of our current focuses is our elevating ESD targets planning project. We, we are currently facilitating a collaboration between 28 councils to progress new and elevated environmental standards in the planning scheme. This includes seeking a target of zero carbon buildings. This work is leading edge and is widely supported by the local government sector. We're currently working with DELP on their ESD or Environmentally Sustainable Development Roadmap project, which seeks to introduce environmentally sustainable development standards into the state planning scheme. We're strongly advocating for the objectives and standards that have been developed by our members to be considered at state level. The City of Port Phillip has been one of the driving councils behind CASB and BESS since our inception. In 2004, Port Phillip and Moreland City Councils initiated the council collaboration that ended up evolving into CASB. These two councils also developed the two precursor tools that evolved into BESS. I'd like to acknowledge the mutual benefit of the relationship between CASB and Port Phillip. CASB has evolved from the leading role that Port Phillip's played in the evolution of sustainability planning in Victoria, and the group as a whole benefits from your leadership. And Port Phillip has benefited from the amplification of action on sustainable built environments that the CASB network, which now represents over 72% of Victorians, and 74% of Victorian planning activity has provided and continues to deliver. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we are going to go back because I believe Catherine Bramwell, uh, who's submitting a public question, is with us. Hi, we got lift off. <laughs> That's all right. Um, Catherine, Catherine, if you could state your name and suburb and then please yes. ask your question. Okay, Catherine Bramwell, Melbourne 3004. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors, for the opportunity to ask my question this evening. Uh, very simply, I've heard along the grapevine that there were two or three speakers at the Special Council meeting last Tuesday who talked about their rates going up by 4.5%. I'm confused. I thought the Council made it clear that the rate increase proposed for the coming financial year was 1.5%. Can you please enlighten me where does this figure of 4.5 per cent come from? All right, uh, I believe we're going to Dennis O'Keefe to answer that question. I'll, I'll take it there, it's Chris Carroll. Uh, Chris Carroll? Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you very much for the question. Rates can certainly be a complex and confusing um, topic, um, particularly given the impacts of an average rate rise under the new annual valuation process will differ greatly between different rate payers depending on the value and the class of their individual property. As per the draft council plan and budget, council is complying with the 1.5% rates cap increase prescribed by the Minister for Local Government with oversight from the Essential Services Commission to make sure that council is um, complying with those obligations. This essentially represents a maximum increase in total rates revenue generated from existing rate payers. Importantly, it excludes growth in the rate payer base or put simply new rates to revenue generated from a number of new properties that must now be serviced. The total amount of total rates revenue, general rates revenue is increasing by 3%. This includes the 1.5% increase under the cap for existing rate payers, 
but also includes um, the increase related to new rate payers or growth in the rate payer base. It's also important to note that total rates revenue is generated from three classes of land, residential, commercial and industrial. So the total rates is split between those three different classes and each has a different percentage change in rates based on changes in property values. Total rates revenue from commercial and industrial property is expected to decrease next financial year due to decreases in property values compared to residential property. This means that the figure around the 4.5% that you've heard actually relates to total rates revenue from residential properties. So that one class of rate payer, it, its um, expected total increase is around 4.5% as per page 110, volume two of the draft council plan and budget. The four and a half percent is made up of the shift from Northern residential to residential based on changes in relative property values. The additional 1,253 new residential properties registered in the current financial year, which council will now receive income from and provide services to, and the one and a half percent general rates increase or cap. It's important to note that rate increase or decrease for individual rate payers will be directly linked to the property, the value of their property as valued by the valuer general as at the 1st of January 2021 as a proportion of the valuation of all, all properties in the municipality. The January 21, 2021 revaluation has seen an average decrease of 0.9% for the municipality. So if your property value is decreased by more than the average, you'll get a lower than rates cap increase, possibly a rates reduction, depending on how big the decrease is. Alternatively, sorry, if it decreases by more than the average, if it decreases less than the average decrease, you will see a higher rate increase than the cap, or if you've actually increased in value, you see a higher increase than the cap. Council will be making sure that we provide um, good communication to the community to ensure that they can understand both the impact for them individually, but overall how rates works and these different outcomes that can happen across different classes and also based on different shifts in value of people's property. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Okay, we are now moving to councillor question time. Councillors, do you have any questions for the officers? No questions. Oh, question, um, Councillor Consolo. Sorry, if you could just give me a second. Of course. Sorry, is anybody else have a question? I just lost my mute. Does anyone else have a question while Councillor Consolo is finding it? I'm ready now. Okay, great. Okay. Given the impacts on local businesses in our community from the latest lockdown and ongoing restrictions and the closure of the South Melbourne market, are officers considering recommending any further assistance to mitigate these impacts as part of the budget? If so, what are officers considering and will these be brought to council for consideration as part of our budget decision next week? Who will respond? I'm happy Who's to sorry? take that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for the question, Councillor Kusulo. Um, look, yes, prior to the South Melbourne market incident today, um, officers have briefed councils on options for additional COVID support in response to lockdown four for South Melbourne market, but also for other um, impacted um, parties. And based on the feedback received, a relief package has been included in the proposed final budget, which will be available um, in the next couple of days and will be considered by councillors at a special council meeting next week. Um, but based on what's happened today, officers are now considering the additional impact on South Melbourne market. And based on this, officers or councillors may propose an amendment to the budget next week, next Wednesday to adjust the level of support provided. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Uh, a councillor Sirikoff has a question. Uh, thank you there. Um, I'm just wondering uh, a question with, uh, without notice regarding the uh, Pickle Street, Bridge Street and Glover Street um, 
disclosure uh, along Pickle Street. I'm just wondering if um, council officers had considered the um, merits of um, other residents um, in terms of um, not having right hand turns from Glover Street and Bridge Street into Pickle Street, but considered the merits of turning right from Pickle Street into those two streets. And the if we do go with a closure of ro the road, the possible downstream impacts on the neighbouring streets, such as Crookshank Street, which is a one way, a narrow one way street. Um, so will we be looking at, um, yes. is, council so, so looking, is council looking at the uh, uh, impacts of the traffic being diverted to other streets? So thank you, Councillor Sirikoff. I might have to hold the answer to that question over for the petition when we get to it, which is very shortly. Okay. So, so hopefully, we may need you to repeat it. We'll just hopefully um, the officers were listening in to the ways you, way you phrased it then. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions, general questions, before we move to reports, though, councillors? No. Okay, so moving on to our ceiling schedule. We don't have any tonight, so let's move. Sorry, councillor Sarah Crosstack, to uh, seven, which is petitions and joint letters. So, councillors, we have one petition on tonight's agenda, which is the trial of safety improvements at the Bridge, Pickles and Glover intersection. So is it possible for officers to respond to Councillor Sirikoff's question or do we need to ask uh, Councillor Sirikoff to repeat it? Uh, through you, Mayor, I think um, I'm happy to uh, answer uh, that question, which uh, really came in uh, two parts. The first one being, um, uh, can has council officers considered um, options other than in closing the median uh, of Pickles so that people, um, cars on Pickles Street can turn right um, into um, Glover or, and or Bridge Street. Uh, and the second part of the question, um, if I've got it right, is what were the sort of downstream impacts or the impact on um, other uh, communities, uh, on, the, on the other communities, if these, uh, on other streets effectively. Um, in answering the uh, question through you, May, I'll just indicate that uh, we uh, received a, the initial petition in May. So, uh, council officers have uh, have come up with a proposal to close um, the median. Um, that proposal followed the petition. It followed an investigation of the number of traffic uh, crashes that have been identified there over the last uh, five years. There have been um, six. Uh, uh, traffic uh, crashes, eight of whom involve eight of which involved injuries. Um, we have then uh, communicated with some 1,112 residents of IML, collecting their responses to the proposal that um, we close median uh, the closed median of, of pickles as a safety measure, and we're still uh, collating that information. Um, in direct response to the aspects that the uh, uh, councillor raised. Um, we have considered whether or not we can retain the capacity to turn right from Pickles into those two streets. I suppose the difficulty is that six out of the uh, out of the six traffic accidents over the last four years, uh, five years, sorry, four of those have involved um, cars turning uh, right um, in Pickles Street into one of those. So that is uh, a difficulty that with, with the proposal. However, through you, we're preparing a report to councillors that will um, pick up uh, all of these issues, including the other responses that we've received um, from um, the community. Uh, we'll also, uh, the proposal is that for 12 months, we will monitor the impact on other surrounding neighbouring streets, which picks up the other part of the uh, councillors' questions. So we, we are concerned that cars will move into neighbouring um, streets. And that is something that we want to monitor if council, when we come back to you with the report, um, support our recommendation. Uh, thank you, Brian. Are there any other question, uh, question from uh, Councillor Pearl? Yes, it's a hellish intersection. It's one of the worst in Port Melbourne from a perception and safety point of view. I'm wondering if you can give me a bit more detail, Mr. T, on the the right-hand turns, as you say, with the six incidents, whether or not there's any commonalities between them? 
Um, were those incidents caused by the oncoming traffic heading towards the city? Were they caused by, um, by rear ends? Is there any commonality between the six that's caused some um, safety issues? Um, Councillor Pearl, I'll need to take that uh, question on notice. Um, and I will provide as part of our report to councillors, not just a, the bland sort of number uh, in terms of the number of uh, crashes, but we will provide as much detail as we can in terms of the nature of those um, accidents so that we can understand whether what is being proposed will actually mitigate some of those um, risks that have been identified. Are there any other questions, councillors? Uh, if not, oh, councillors, we have an officer's uh, council appeal to move. Do I have a seconder for the motion? I'm happy to second. Uh, Councillor Pearl, would you like to speak to the motion? I'll reserve if that's okay, Chair. Yep, I don't need to speak. Um, would any other councillors like to speak to the motion? Uh, we might go back, straight back to you, Councillor Pearl. That was easy. Look, we, we hear there's a big issue with this intersection from an actual safety point of view and a perception of safety point of view and something needs to be done about it. The, the reality is when a solution is done, there's going to be people that are going to be happy with it and those that are going to be unhappy with it. But Council must form its basis from the uh, foundation that this needs to be a safe intersection. We have data indicating that it's currently not that. Um, and as someone that uses it almost daily and I've tried usually tries to avoid it daily. Um, I sympathise with the people that are, are constant users to this intersection and uh, their perceptions of safety. The issues surrounding local residents must be put into consideration. Um, and there's several petitions and a large number of very vocal feedback from a number of people on the numerous proposals that uh, pertain to this intersection. Uh, but doing nothing, I don't think is an, is an option here. Uh, we need to come up with a suitable trial that it comes from a foundation of safety that also takes into the consideration of the local residents, but we have an unsafe intersection here that we desperately need to look into. Uh, Council should be very proud of the improvements that's made on Pickle Street, particularly pertaining to visibility um, issues we had there four or five years ago, and we have changed the speed limit on Pickle Street that's made this um, very uh, you know, heavily used and increasing, uh, increasingly so um, thoroughfare uh, safer for the local residents. Um, happy to move this. We're considering um, this at a future council meeting. And please note that you've got till Friday this week to provide us uh, feedback on the uh, proposals that are currently out there. So thanks to the officers for putting this together and continuing the work to uh, make this intersection safer. I will now put the motion under division and I'll call upon each of you for your vote. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. The motion is carried. Councillors, we're moving on to our presentation of reports. Um, so we're going to start with, uh, slightly out of order, uh, with report 12.2, which is the South Melbourne Market Strategic Plan 2021 to 2025 for endorsement. So are there any questions for the officers um, about this report, councillors? No, there are no questions. Councillors, we then have an officer's recommendation. Would someone like to move this or something different? Councillor Pearl to move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Consolo. Councillor Pearl. I'll reserve again if that's okay, Ma'am. Yes. Uh, Councillor Consolo. Uh, it's been an honour to be on the South Melbourne Market Committee. A lot of work has, and community consultation has gone into this document. And I'm happy to support it and look forward to it being implemented. We will see improvements as well as the history and existing character still shining through at the market. So I'd like to endorse the strategic plan. Would any other councillors like to speak to this report or to the motion, sorry, to the motion? Councillor Bond? 
Um, I won't be supporting this. I think there's too great a focus in this proposal on the South Melbourne market online direct. Um, the way it's set up, it will never ever um, deliver a surplus. It will never break even and never make money. It's uh, an incredible drain on the South Melbourne market finances, which are already in a precarious position as a result of COVID and many other factors. The market is a physical market, not an online market. The focus of the market uh, plan and the focus of the next five years for this market should be on the physical space and making the best possible physical space, not on 20 or so transactions a week that come through South Melbourne Market Direct, um, as opposed to the 10 or 20,000 transactions a week, probably more 50,000 transactions a week that physically take place at the market. The traders down there need um, us to focus on their physical space at this point in time and not be distracted by bright shiny objects, which this South Melbourne Market Direct is. Um, the traders down there are nervous about the proposed rent increases that have been floated around. Um, that those rate increases or rent increases are going to be a huge burden on the traders down there, especially at such a time when they're all, all small business um, including the South Melbourne market, are uh, struggling financially at the moment. So I think we should you know, stop chasing bright, shiny objects. We should get on with the physical space of the market. It's a great physical space. It should always be about the physical space, not about um, other, other whims that will only distract from the performance of this particular market. So I won't be supporting this five-year plan. Uh, would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Uh, Councillor Martin. Oh, we can't hear you, Councillor Martin. We haven't. Well, well, sorry, Madam Mayor. While I agree with Councillor Bond that the market is a very, very physical space, we certainly don't want to lose that aspect of the market as we move into digital times. It's certainly very reasonable for the market to explore a move into cyberspace. However, in the briefings that we've had with the market officials, they've been very clear that if they don't see this being a successful a successful um, initiative, they're not going to put an awful lot of time and effort into it, but it's, we're, we're giving them the go ahead to at least explore this and see how it goes. I hope that it will be very successful. We know that they're not going to waste a whole lot of time and effort if it's going to be unsuccessful. Certainly worth pursuing, so I endorse the plan. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Um, I, I will briefly speak to the motion. I just want to thank, um, Advisory Committee and Danielle um, for the great work and, and to Councillor Pearl and Consolo for their great work on the uh, on the committee. I know it takes up a lot of time and, and mental energy as well as physical. Look, I was really excited to see the report and the feedback that we got. Uh, most of it just cemented in my mind, um, again, how valuable the South Melbourne market is to our community as a gathering place, as much as it provides a good quality and a great variety of, of um, fresh food and other items. And I note that, that that was actually at the heart of what the community told us, that they want us to keep this gem a gem, uh, whether it's improving congestion around the, um, the market uh, and, or, and keeping that variety and good value. Uh, I did note that I was really heartened to see that our community picked up on sustainability and wanted more of a mention of that in the plan. I think that just uh, reflects the, the values of our community, which was great. And I noticed how important um, people saw the digital element as being, I think we can walk and chew gum. Um, so I, I think that that's, uh, you know, I think there is a challenge that as being a well-loved uh, asset to council and our community, um, we can't demand financial sustainability and then not also um, look at perhaps rate, uh, rent increases slightly, maybe over time uh, to, to look at how we manage um, to maintain this beautiful asset and keep it, make it more accessible physically, maintain good value um, in terms of the traders uh, and look after the traders as we will be doing, as mentioned, um, so considering next week on the budget. So now I'm gonna, um, Councillor Clark would like to speak to the motion. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, I too share uh, Councillor Bond's concerns about the online platform. Um, it is a fact that it's struggling, and um, but I will support this motion uh, on the basis of the good faith that the advisory committee has shown throughout its discussions, and that uh, should the results that we see over the next 
uh, six to 12 months not, uh, not change or not overly improve, then we'll be able to have the discussions that we, we have talked about and that there's an openness to accept that we've tried it and it doesn't work. If it does work, fantastic. And it can, it can grow from there. So um, I think the majority of the plan uh, is good and did take into account our feedback. So uh, on that basis and the opportunity for ongoing consultation and discussions about um, the online platform, um, we do need to see financial improvement on the market. It's clearly a challenge in this ongoing COVID world. Um, but we have taken some steps uh, towards that in what, what we're forecasting. I guess that could be impacted further if we keep having these hotspots and COVID uh, lockdowns, but the general direction is enough for me to support it. Um, thank you. Uh, would anyone likes to speak, else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Sirikoff. Thank you. Um, yeah, I share the same uh, concerns that Councillor uh, um, Bond and Clark have expressed. Um, uh, while I'm, I'm, I will be, I'm going to be supporting uh, uh, this this motion. Um, but as as it was, uh, it, we already have spoken about this. Um, this when we spoke about the strategy on the South Melbourne market not long ago, and um, the in that report, it was uh, forecasted that the South Melbourne market would see a turnaround and a profit in 22-23. So I'm I'm really um, hopeful and keen that um, they'll be able to uh, uh, deliver that uh, turnaround profit. And um, and I hope that, um, that the South Melbourne Direct works well, but given that the financials we were shown um, not long ago, um, I'm not quite sure how well it's going to be um, received and actually used by the community. I agree that the South Melbourne Mark is a place where you want to go to for an experience and this is what's made it so popular and a gem for South Melbourne um, or for the whole of Port Phillip. But um, I just hope uh, that the uh, market does turn around and that we, we see it as a great place for uh, the community and also for the uh, storeholders. Thank you. You're on mute. You're on mute. Hold a minute. No, can't hear. Oh, I'll go ahead. I think that's what you're saying. Yep. I got, um, thank you. Thank you to the people that provided feedback from us since we put this plan out for consultation. You would note that it's not a piecemeal consultation. The consultation is very much rigid. 35% of people were underwhelmed or unsupportive of the strategic plan. That's a good thing that we've heard from those people. I'm not sure we've adjusted the plan substantially enough to um, appease what all of them have said, but there are some common threads there, particularly around the trader mix, uh, which we hear loud and clear, and the financial sustainability of the market. In terms of the financial sustainability of the market, it gets a, a, a much larger focus in this report than it's ever had in the previous two strategic plans, and that's a right and good thing to do. Um, it's perplexing in some respects to many people that the market is so heavily subsidised by ratepayers, and that's completely understandable. Um, but it also needs to be put in context that uh, this asset is of a very peculiar nature in terms of the uplift of money it needs to be maintained and the uh, depreciation bill that that causes uh, the market's profit and loss every year. And that's only going to increase. So it's only right that the um, committee should focus on financial sustainability, but it's going to be an uphill task um, producing um, sustainable results, particularly over the next five to 10 years as increasing depreciation bills come through the profit and loss. But what we do want to see is a cash situation for the market for it to um, wash its face, so to speak, so to reduce the burden on ratepayers. 
What we have seen like, during the COVID period over the past 12 uh, to 18 months is just how important the South Melbourne market is as a piece of um, social infrastructure. When we had click and collect or um, order and collect set up there, which again was a, a loss making venture, but something put up to help the community. Uh, on a single day, we had close to a thousand orders being processed for our community in a safe and efficient way, which was very well received by most members of the community. Um, I'm not as concerned as some are about direct. I think that will, um, albeit it's a distracting focus at the moment, I think it will run its natural course and its ultimate test for direct at the moment is now, if it didn't work during COVID for um, lockdown in Victoria, then um, you'd have to say, um, we'll probably have to put that under a cloud. But once that item is dealt with towards the end of the year, there's still some very exciting things in this plan that we should have um, a, a lot of focus moving forward, particularly in the digital space. One thing I'd definitely like to see is item number three in the digital space come to fruition, which is gathering consumer insight and improved visitor experience. Um, I've always held the thing that a South Melbourne local's passport or some form of loyalty scheme attached to the market that will allow us to gather more customer insight um, and particularly to start gaining more insight about what the basket size of each consumer looks like there through a reward scheme could potentially be done. Um, and all those items are listed in the strategic plan. So that's obviously where the focus needs to be moving forward. Also exciting things to look forward in this plan are the long awaited development of the York Street car park and also York Street itself. So five years from now, we hope that the market is more successful than it is today. Um, and it's coming from a terrific foundation at the moment. It's a, it's a wonderful community asset and it's been a huge success all because of the people that have been on the committee, the board, um, and have run the market, particularly over the past couple of decades. Uh, it's something we should be very proud of. And if you look at competing markets and the troubles they have at the moment, such as Pran and Victoria Market, the South Melbourne Market is in a league of its own. Um, and with hard work and strategic focus, we can keep it that way. So councillors, I hope um, I can convince you to support the strategic plan. Um, you may not agree with everything that's in the strategic plan and nor do I, but there's enough of a framework here to move forward. And we've heard from our community in terms of what they want also. So um, this is not gonna be an easy plan to um, execute, particularly around uh, modernising the rental arrangements in place, particularly for some of our much larger traders in the market. Uh, but we, I think we have the team on board at the moment to make this plan become a reality as the years go by. Thank you. I'm going to put that under division. Uh, Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Against. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. That motion is carried. Thank you. We're now moving on to item 9.1, which is the Older Persons Consultative Committee, updated terms of reference and appointment of members for 2021 to 2024. Uh, are there any questions to the officers, councillors? No, there being no questions, uh, we have an officer's recommendation. Would someone like to move this or something different? Um, Councillor Martin to move, Councillor Pearl to second. Councillor Martin. Madam Mayor, I'm delighted to be able to move this motion this evening and you've heard me speak in the chamber on a number of occasions about what a wonderful group the Older Persons Consultative Committee, as it is for the next two minutes is, we're about to become the Older Persons Advisory Committee because OPAC's easy to pronounce and it's a far better way of representing what we do. The existing talented members of the committee are some of the best people I've worked with in the local community and we interviewed a large number of absolutely outstanding applicants who wish to join our committee. They come from a range of backgrounds across Port Phillip. They represent a very wide range of diverse areas and they're going to be a huge asset to the committee. An awful lot of work has gone into putting together the updated terms of reference. And I believe that our OPAC is going to perform even bigger and better over its next three years than the existing OPCC is. I'd like to congratulate Frida and her team who work to get the committee to where it is and the council officers who supported them. And I have absolute pleasure in commending this motion to my fellow councillors and to the citizens of Port Phillip. 
Um, just before we move to you, Council Pearl, I just want to check, do we need to show on the screen the names of the new members? Can we move to that slide? Or, or do I need to do that at the end? Mm. Do we need we need to fill that in, don't we, before I'm yes. through you through you, Mayor, I'll just get some advice, but I think Councillor March in moving it would need to fill in three points yeah, sorry about that. in the yeah. attachment. I'll just check that with Mr. Keenan. Tony, that's right. I think that's correct, Mayor. I think that's yeah, so we might um, fill those in before we proceed any further. Councillor Martin, do you have that list in front of you, or do we need to get the officers to I speak it? it? The officers may get it fast, and it'll take me about a minute to find it. Okay. Oh, um, Kurt, Sorry, I was having technical difficulties um, through you, Mayor. Thank you, thank you, Tony Keenan. You so want me to provide the names? Is that correct? Yeah, I think oh, actually, oh, it's all right. We're doing it now. Just okay. if you could keep an eye and make sure they're correct, that would be great. Please. I will do. Thank you. <laughs> So I believe that's all of the names. Great. Yep, correct. Okay. Fantastic. So um uh we'll so Councillor Martin has moved it, we'll go to count and speak spoken to it. So Councillor Pearl. Nothing for me, Madam Mayor. Happy to support. Okay. Uh would anyone else like to speak to the motion? I'll briefly speak if I may. Um I'm always amazed at the people who are on any of our advisory committees uh, and the, the members that I know of the, um, the previous ones who have been reappointed are, are very impressive. And I really look forward, I do I recognise or know a few of the, the new appointees and I really look forward to meeting and finding out more. The wealth of knowledge um, that you bring uh, makes us a better council. So I just want to thank you for putting your hands up to be part of this committee. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Martin, would you like to close? Just in summary, we're so lucky to have such a talented group of older citizens who want to be there to support our local community and our council in particular. And I urge councillors to endorse this very enthusiastically. Well, let's put that to the vote under division. Uh, Councillor Clark. Mm -hmm. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford, four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. The motion is carried. Welcome to the new members of the committee. We're moving on to an item where I need to declare, which is 10.1, where uh, which is the tender award provision of civil infrastructure and maintenance services. So I'm just going to read my conflict of interest and then hand step out of the meeting virtually and uh, hand over to the Deputy Mayor. So I have a potential perceived interest in report 10.1, the tender award provision of in civil infrastructure maintenance services due to an association with the tenderer. So I will now remove myself from the meeting and request that the Deputy Mayor assumes the chair. Thanks, Madam Mayor. I'll send you a quick message when we're good to go. Um, Okay, councillors, we're moving to item 10.1, which is tender award of provision of civil infrastructure and maintenance services. Thank you to Lachlan Johnson and ably assisted by Donna, Nick, Peter and Andrew who have prepared the report for you this evening. Councillors, any questions of officers? Councillor Clark, go ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, ask the question of how important is safety to this contract? Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you, Councillor Clark, for your question. Um, look, I'll refer through to Council's um, Senior Project Manager, Andrew Farrell, to speak to 
how safety was incorporated into the tender evaluation. But um, generally speaking, the safety of council staff and contractors is, is of paramount concern in all activities. Um, we've assessed um, all tenderers, including the recommended tenderers, uh, safety management systems, safety history uh, as part of the tender award report. Um, in addition, we've undertaken uh, reference checks to assess how their commitments, their written commitments around safety and well-being of their staff are actually put into action. But I'll defer to Andrew Farrell to actually explain uh, how that was captured in the tender evaluation process. Thank you, Lachlan. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, through you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Lachlan, and thank you, Councillor Clark, uh, for the question. Um, there's only probably a, a bit that I can add to Lachlan's uh, apt uh, description there already, which is in, in terms of this particular contract, um, and it's, it's always a balance in, in terms of the OH&S, we actually have set the bar high in terms of the mandatory conditions that we expected of all tenderers, in terms of that they are required to have an independently audited uh, pre-qualified OHS system. Um, which is essentially what reflects a slightly lower percentage in terms of the, the weighted average. It, it's only 5% in this case of the, the total weighting, but that is to reflect the fact that the bar was set extremely high, as high as we could set it for contractors. Uh, and just to reiterate some of what Lachlan's already explained there, all tenderers were given very extensive uh, OHS questionnaires, well above the council's standard. And in this case, all, all of the submissions were of high quality um, and it, of particular note with the recommended tenderer, uh, they provided excellent examples of the use of that system in practice in terms of in the day-to-day -day activities that they undertake with the staff, just reinforcing our assessment uh, that's it's in the submitted report. Thanks, Andrew. Thank Councillor Clark, Chief Joan, with your questions. Thank you. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I know, given the importance of safety, that it has a weighting, as you mentioned, of 5%, and corporate social responsibility has a weighting of 15%. And given the nature of this contract, um, I'd just like to understand further what you take into account or what's considered when you're looking at corporate social responsibility to be weighted 15% against safety, occupational health and safety about building roads and footpaths at 5%. Lachlan? Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you, Councillor Clark. So as uh, Andrew was explaining, we actually set a filter criteria um, up front. So before we actually got into the assessment um, where we considered the 5% for OHS and the 15% safety, we actually only considered um, tenderers who submitted who actually met a minimum benchmark for safety, which as Andrew said, was that they had a uh, safety, um, uh, an independently audited safety management system in place. So we actually didn't, the way that we structured the tender process was that before we actually got to the assessment, we you know, um, set a very high bar there to make sure that the, people, the tenderers that got through already met our safety requirements. When we uh, got into that actual detailed assessment on um, uh, the different criteria, um, the tender evaluation plan contains the assessment approach. So some of the things that we considered in that 5% consideration of the oh &S after we'd gone through the filter process was looking at um, the history of how their safety management systems have been implemented. Um, we also looked at uh, the safety culture in the organisation and we tried to assess some of the things that um, are not covered as part of having an independently audited um, safety management system. In terms of um, uh, corporate social responsibility, um, so while that was set at 15%, there was no um, filter criteria that relates to CSR that we use. So that 15% assessment was the sole assessment that pertained to corporate social responsibility. Some of the things that we assessed in that area were around um, uh, Indigenous procurement, um, social enterprise engagement, the procurement of local um, products, uh, looking at sustainability initiatives, um, alignment with council strategies such as ACT and ADAPT, waste diversion uh, and things like that. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Clark, go ahead. Uh, and just the final one then, am I correct in thinking that, uh, yes, you set a high bar for um, health and safety, but as, as you're evaluating that, 
um, and let's say, you know, the, the tenderers, the applicants came up with different scores, but then uh, someone who might have had a high score could be tipped out, um, maybe a high score in health and safety could have been tipped out by someone who had um, something, be something better in social responsibility because the weighting is 15% versus 5%. Lachlan, go ahead. Through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, Councillor Clark, um, in terms of the approach that we took, the philosophy was that um, we set a benchmark that the companies that would actually go through to that assessment, where you'd actually weight off all the different uh, criteria, price being some of them, OHS being some, corporate social responsibility being others, and uh, you know, methodology, capacity, et cetera. Um, what we did was we set uh, uh, used the philosophy that um, if we were actually going to do, get to that assessment, we would only do that assessment on companies that were um, acceptable from a, a, an OHS perspective. So we wouldn't actually progress anyone through to that round um, that didn't actually look meet those bare minimum requirements. Now, when I say bare minimum requirements for OHS, as Andrew alluded to in his response uh, to your earlier question those requirements were very high. So those assessment requirements that we set meant that um, all of the tenderers who progressed through to that final round where there was a, a, a sort of um, a weighting uh, put to those different criteria, all of them would have been acceptable from, a, from an oh &S perspective. That last 5% um, assessment, that was the allowance there for where some contractors were potentially slightly ahead um, of others. Um, but all of the um, tenderers who progressed to that round met council's requirements from an OHS perspective. And that was really important because um, to your earlier question, um, this involves construction work and maintenance work. It's out in the traffic. This is uh, high risk work and um, OHS and safety is absolutely critical uh, for a contract such as this. Thank, Thank you, Lachlan. Councillor Martin. Um, Deputy Mayor, this is one of the more complex motions that's come across in my eight months on council, and I think I have finally got my head around it, but I'm confident that there are a number of people who are probably following this meeting who may not realise the financial significance of this. Is it possible for council officers to very, very briefly summarise for anyone who's not already familiar with this uh, item what the financial implications are before we vote on it? Very glad you asked that. Very relevant question, Councillor Martin. So, uh, Lachlan, if you could do exactly that for us, we'd be very grateful. Uh, I can do that, Deputy Mayor. Uh, yes, Councillor Martin, um, this is quite a complicated uh, report. Um, in essence, uh, what we're asking Council to consider tonight is entering into a contract that we estimate the total value to be about $29 million over seven years. That $29 million is made up of two components. One of them is a, a fixed uh, a lump sum component that um, is subject to only minor adjustments each year. The other component of that $29 million is a schedule of rates. That schedule of rates depends on how many uh, specific items that we actually need to do. So um, for a simplistic sort of analogy, you know, if we've got more potholes in the city in one year, that may cost us more uh, in terms of uh, maintenance in that area than we would in another year. So that $29 million over seven years is based on an estimate around the maintenance work that will be required to maintain the civil infrastructure uh, in a state that is fit for the city. Thank you, Lachlan. Councillor Sirigoff, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Councillor Pearl. Um, I'm just wondering, going a little bit granular, um, I'm just wondering, uh, was there any criteria for the road surface characteristics that um, this company will have to um, deliver? And I, so do you know what, do you want me to explain what I mean by road surface characteristics? Yep, that'd be good. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just wondering, like, uh, is Port Phillip any different from any any other councils in terms of the depth and quality of the materials? Like, do we go four centimetres or as opposed to six centimetres compared with other councils? Do we do we um, in our, in the in the um, the criteria of the tender 
do we ask for anything different from any other council? So lock, lock me if you help us with that one. Perhaps also the frequency that things are done at as well would be interested to hear about. Lachlan, go ahead. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, um, Councillor Sirikoff, as part of the uh, preparation uh, to go to market for this tender, we undertook a detailed review of the specification. Um, we've got obviously got an existing civil infrastructure maintenance contract. We didn't just reuse that contract. We actually went and did a detailed review. We looked at the frequency of um, maintenance. We looked at uh, the standards and the designs that relate to, for example, uh, the thickness of the road pavement or the thickness of our asphalt footpaths or our signage standards, things like that. We've got a new set of standard drawings um, that have been prepared by council to actually make sure that um, the infrastructure that is built for the city of Port Phillip is suitable for the city of Port Phillip. Um, when you compare local governments, um, all local governments have roads, but there are very different conditions. Um, obviously, um, we are uh, close to the sea, um, so we have different sort of exposures there in terms of asset requirements. Um, we also have different soil types uh, and other things uh, that are predominant uh, in the city of Port Phillip. So um, it's very difficult to compare kind of standard road approaches across different councils. Um, we also, have, the other things that we have to consider as well is the traffic volumes uh, on our roads. So as, as I say, as part of preparing the specification for this tender, um, we went through and we undertook a detailed review looking at um, all of those different components to ensure that it was fit for purpose. Councillor Sirikoff, has that satisfied your question? Uh, I'm just for real, yes and no. Feel um, free to follow up. Um, just trying to think this through. Um, so just with, even if you were to compare us, our council against neighbouring councils along the, along the bay, um, just wondering, do we, uh, were the specifications that we do have road surfaces that are thicker than say, Bayside, or given that both or other count councils would also have main roads and streets, you know, suburban streets, residential streets. Um, so, so Lachlan, perhaps you could be specific in terms of Bayside's um, road base depth, etc., and how we compare at a high level to other councils. Do, yeah, well, are we asking a, a different, like a high quality of or a thicker road service compared to other similar council okay. and- well, Lachlan, yeah. if you go ahead, that'd be great. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, I can provide uh, some information on this, but getting into the detail about comparing different councils, I, I don't have that information available to me, but I can take it on notice and provide something in the minutes. Um, in terms of uh, sort of generally speaking, our roads are actually in quite good relative condition um, across the municipality. So we have, because of the sort of nature of the, the ground conditions we have in the city of Port Phillip and the, uh, the sort of years of when our roads were constructed, we have a lot of macadam pavements, which are um, have really long lifespans. So our road conditions are generally pretty good. Under this contract, um, a lot of our, uh, uh, um, a lot of the work is related to maintenance. So the capital construction component, so building, a, you know, resheeting an entire road kind of stuff, that is no longer part of the civil infrastructure maintenance contract. So the decision was made to take that out of this contract. So that's actually provided for um, uh, in a separate panel of contracts that council is establishing. So really this contract we're talking about relatively minor patching to potholes and sort of areas where um, in the road you get failure and need that, that kind of maintenance. We're also talking about things like um, crack sealing and preventative maintenance to prevent failures from propagating and becoming worse. Just in general speaking, our asset management plan calls for a hundred millimeter um, uh, road surface on arterial roads and a 40 millimeter surface uh, on local roads. We've done deflection testing um, across the roads um, and that's covered in council's asset management plans. And we've actually got extremely long lifespan predictions for our roads based on 
um, the uh, based on the condition that they're in now and sort of predictions of future use. So we're actually estimating that some of our roads have predicted useful lifespans of over 100 years. So generally speaking, the road conditions in Port Phillip are really, really good. Um, under this contract, the specification has been developed to ensure that it's appropriate for those conditions. Um, and I can uh, take on notice and provide some comparative information with what um, similar councils have in terms of their civil infrastructure standards in the minutes. Thanks, Lachlan. I think that's exactly what Councillor Fierkoff was looking for. Um, Councillor Martin, go ahead. To you, Deputy Mayor, I gather that under the present contract arrangements, if there are issues with the contractor's work, um, the citizens of Port Phillip can go directly through the contractor to rectify things. I understand that there have been some changes. What are we doing to make sure that if people have concerns, that their concerns are going to be addressed quickly under the terms of the new contract? Lachlan, did you get all that? I did. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, through you, um, Councillor Martin, um, we really encourage um, the citizens and the residents and visitors and traders of the City of Port Phillip um, to raise any concerns that they have with Council uh, around um, Council's assets um, or workmanship. Uh, the best way to do that is to contact Council directly um, through Council's assist service. Um, there have been some slight changes uh, to um, the provisions around customer service that relate to this contract uh, in light of the significant investment that Council's undertaking uh, around the customer experience program. Um, the intent uh, there is that um, information is provided to the community that takes into account um, not just works that are happening or uh, potentially happening near uh, their residence or near their shop, um, but also takes into account other things uh, that could be going on as well. So under this contract, we've restructured that component. So contact with residents, contact with traders, contact with people who'd be affected by works um, is provided through by council um, as opposed to by the contractor. So the contractor really becomes under this contract a definitive service provider, um, whereas council remains the contact for residents. But I really do encourage um, any residents or uh, traders or visitors who have concerns around workmanship or around uh, assets to contact uh, council's assist service where uh, we can follow those issues up. Thank you very much. There being no further questions, councillors, uh, you have an officer's recommendation or would you like to move an alternative? Can I open it up to you? Okay, I'll move the officer's recommendation. I'm looking for a seconder. And thank you, Councillor Martin, for seconding it. I'll, leave, um, I'll hold by right. So, uh, Councillor Martin, a seconder, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you to the council officers who put an enormous amount of work into this and thank you council officers for helping us as councillors understand all the ramifications. Awful lot of work has gone into it and we've seen, thank you very much for the questions that you've answered. Um, I think, um, I'm almost lost for words here, but it's, it's, there's such an enormity of work that's gone into this and it's taken me so long to get my head around it. Um, I, I don't see how any of us could quibble with any of the work that's gone into this and I can only endorse the outstanding job that the council has done in putting this, uh, this recommendation together for us. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Would any other councillors like to comment on this um, motion? No, I'll close by saying a thank you to the officers, particularly Lachlan. This is a bit of a, I wouldn't say a vexed contract, but it's a very highly visible contract. Um, and it's something councillors take very, very seriously in terms of uh, we always as councillors get lots of feedback about what's happening with um, Fulton Hogan and the work that they're doing on our footpaths and our curbs and our um, civil infrastructure, et cetera. So it's a very visible contract. It's a very large contract. Um, and also, I think Lachlan, for a few years ago, coming and spending a few hours with me working through the details of the predecessor to this contract, because as Councillor Martin says, it is very complicated in some respects. Um, it is large, potentially, um, and it's a key service of Council that we need to ensure that we're good and getting good value for money for. Uh, I have a level of confidence that the officers are certainly putting in place a foundation at the moment that will ensure that the um, appropriate level of transparency and consistency is there to get a good level of work through in these all important tasks at also a good value. 
um, I hope we're taking the strategically right direction, particularly by opening these contracts up more, um, as Lachlan was talking about before, based on the level of inflation that's starting to be priced through the system that will, I think, be persistent for at least the next two or three years. So hopefully we're making the right strategic approach here. Um, but again, I think Lachlan and his team for presenting here this evening and putting the hard work together. So happy to uh, support this motion and encourage you to do so also. So councillors, I'll put that motion to you under division for vote. Uh, Councillor Copsey, if you go ahead and vote. Four. Councillor Crawford is not with us. Uh, Councillor Consolo, go ahead. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl is in favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. I declare that motion carried. And just give me a moment to call the mayor back in. Am I back? Welcome back, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Pearl. Okay, so we're up to item 12.1, which is the amendment C161 Port Part 2 adoption. Uh, councillors, do we have any questions for the officers on this item? I have some questions, but would anyone else like to ask some questions first? No, I might, I might take those on if I may. Um, I believe uh, um, it might be Catherine Pound who might answer them. So there were a couple of um, qu uh, people that spoke to this item. And the first one was in the papers, the St Kilda sea baths are um, listed as to be included as significant or uh, contributory so that we can investigate the social history, if any. What would that mean if we found it wasn't? Would it then be removed at a later date uh, from this amendment? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yes, it is Catherine Pound here. And so in relation to the sea baths, the, the amendment actually proposed to change the grading of the property. It's already within a heritage overlay and it proposed to change the grading from non-contributory to contributory. Now the panel has recommended that the non-contributory grading remain and that is the position that we have um, recommended council adopt today. Um, in relation to the, CBAR, the the panel's other recommendation, they did recommend that council may wish to investigate the potential social history um, and significance of the CBARs to inform whether a change in grading would be warranted. Um, if council wants to pursue that, it would be a separate piece of work. It would be a, a heritage review of the CBARs to undertake that social investigation, as well as a more detailed investigation into the building itself. Um, and that depending on the outcome of that, it may recommend that the grading either um, change to a contributory or significant. It could recommend that the grading stay the same as nil, or it could recommend that the heritage overlay be removed in entirety. But yes, that would be a separate piece of work for council to, to do. So could I just clarify, if I may? Um, so technically what we're, um, the CBARS is remaining the same as it all already has it's already under heritage overlay, so there is no change to its uh, the kind of um, requirements right now for permits to them. Yes, Madam Mayor, through you, that's that's correct. So it's proposed to retain the nil grading, so it will remain in the heritage overlay, which means that there is a planning permit trigger to do certain things. Um, but no, yes, thank you. <laughs> no, sorry, um, thank you. And and the other one. Uh, Oh no, I, I think I think that's been answered. Sorry. Um, has anyone else got any questions? Uh, oh, I do. Uh, Christian, uh, Councillor Sirikoff. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Can you um? Could uh, one of the council officers please um remind us about the status of the property uh, from fifty six to um fifty six to sixty Queens Road? The status of how it, how it was moving. Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, that is a property which is not currently in a heritage overlay at all. It is proposed to be introduced into a heritage overlay. Um, that is council's um, position in the amendment that has 
been that was put to the panel and the panel um, agreed with council's position that it was it, it is a place that has heritage significance which does warrant protection and so the uh, panel has recommended that a heritage overlay be placed over that property and that's the position that we're putting to council tonight as well I may ask one more question if that's okay. So in regards to 5860 Queens Road, can I ask um, as part of this, um, can we take into consideration the views of other submitters um, as uh, one of the speakers referred to because it's to ensure their view is never built in front of? Um, is that something one we can consider of whether we adopt this amendment? And, and two, is modern more, um, a version of Art Deco, is it of that same period? Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor. In relation to the first part of that question, um, it is correct that the owners, some of the owners of the adjoining apartment building, Eve Apartment Building, did call a heritage expert to the panel to support the heritage amendment. Um, in relation to the issue of impacts on views, that's not something that's relevant to the consideration of whether a heritage overlay would apply to the property or not, where um, both council and the panel can only consider whether there is um, potential, whether the, the apartments at 58 to 60 Queens Road themselves have potential heritage significance. And that's the only thing that can really be considered in, in this matter. Um, in terms of the second part of your question, you've asked about the terminology of um, the modern language. Um, the panel accepted that it's a legitimate term to, to describe the style of these buildings. I think there was some debate at the panel over the use of that term, but um, council's heritage expert who, who appeared put forward that this was a, an appropriate term to describe the building. As to whether that's a subset of uh, Art Deco or not, I'm not sure off the top of my head, I apologise, but it certainly was a, a term that was just debated at the panel and agreed that it did apply and and the panel recommended that it that terminology remain. Thank you. Are there any other questions, councillors? If not, we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover and seconder, please? Anyone? Uh, thank you, Councillor Copsey, to move. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Bond, Councillor Copsey. I'll just reserve, thanks, Mayor. Councillor Bond. Um, yes, Madam Mayor, just very briefly to say that protection of heritage is very, very important. Um, it is one of the main contributors to the value of many of our properties in Port Phillip, especially around Middle Park, Albert Park, South Melbourne, um, is because we have been reasonably strict over the years on preserving our, our heritage. So I don't share the concerns of those who um, believe that heritage protection will, will drop their property value. It's, you know, Certainly, there may be a, a short-term um, inability to develop your property, but as all the houses in Middle Park, Albert Park, and vast swathes of Port Phillip show that heritage-protected properties will increase a lot faster than non-heritage-protected policy. So, I, I don't share those concerns. So, I welcome this report. I welcome the the panel findings, which were generally in line with most of. The the, the findings also of our officers. So certainly we'll be supporting this report. Councillor Pearl. Thanks very much. Very happy to support this as well. I do have a bit more sympathy than Councillor Bond does for the people on, at 58 because it beggars belief to me how that apartment building can be heritage listed, yet the state government wouldn't her refuse to heritage list the London Hotel, <clears throat> which um, you would argue had more heritage value to it. But let's, um, let's not. Uh, confusing and move on, but I, I would say in terms of the development value that's lost on this site on Queens Road in particular, um, hopefully over the long run, given the ample open space that this apartment block has and the availability of things like parking or the things that the current developments take for granted uh, as the years go by, to Councillor Bond's point, some of the evidence does actually indicate from a capital appreciation value point of view, um, 
it can actually be fairly advantageous, albeit I would understand that from a development point of view, that this site would probably have a much more substantial yield than what is currently on it. Um, I don't think the building at the moment, from my point of view, is, is particularly um, architecturally amazing. Uh, but if we let uh, a number of the heritage properties that around Alpha Park, Middle Park, Port Melbourne, um, and South Melbourne in particular, um, go by the wayside 50 or 60 years ago, uh, I, I think our suburb would not be as livable as they are today. So regardless of what I think about the architectural benefits of this building, um, I think it is something that probably should be preserved. And um, I agree with the panel's findings as well as the council officer's recommendations. I'm very happy to support this report and thank you to the officers for contributing it to us. Um, would anyone else like to speak to the motion? I'll go back to Councillor Copsey. Thank you. I'll just briefly close by acknowledging that this is a really exhaustive process. Um, that had a lot of work has gone in from the officers. Um, work, hard work in developing and going through the panel process and participating. And also that there has been a huge involvement by members of the community who have participated uh, and contributed to the knowledge that's being um, enshrined in the planning scheme through this, um, but also providing opinions and feedback uh, about the special places in our city. So thank you very, very much for all of the hard work that goes into um, a report like this. It's lengthy and um, it's full of fantastic information and detail about our city, uh, which we can now put into practice. Thanks very much. Okay, let's put that to the vote. Councillor Crawford, four. Councillor Consolo, four. Councillor Martin, four. Councillor Pearl, in favour. Councillor Sirikoff, four. Councillor Baxter, four. Councillor Bond, four. Councillor Clark, four. Councillor Copsey. Four. That motion is passed. Uh, so we might take 10 minutes break uh, um, and then re resume at 8.30, everyone. And we'll be coming back with item, I can't say the number 13.1, which is the library action plan. So see you all in 10 minutes. All right, thanks everyone. We're back for our item 13.1, which is the council endorsement of the library action plan. Councillors, do we have any questions for the officers? If there are no questions, we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover and a seconder? seconder? I'm happy to move. Uh, do I have a seconder? Councillor Surikoff, what does an A stand for? Oh, an amendment. Okay. Yes. Okay. Can I, can I do that now or do I have to wait? I think technically, because I said I would move it, you may have to wait to amend. I'll, I'll, I'll get seek advice on that. Just because it was very slow, I was waiting for someone to. Uh, through you, Mayor, as you've moved it, you'll need to seek a seconder and uh, following it being seconded, if a councillor Sirikoff would like to move an amendment. Yes, all right, so I do have a seconder, which is Councillor Baxter. All right, so I will reserve my right to speak to it. Councillor Baxter. Um, am I on? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, look, uh, we've um, we've been working on this uh, action plan since the last um, council and uh, just wanna thank the um, the officers for putting, uh, putting this together with consultation um, with various sections of the, the community as well as councillors. Um, I think this is going to be a great way for us to uh, plan out uh, the future of our, our libraries uh, in the city of Port Phillip. Um, libraries are really very special places to a lot of people in our communities for a variety of different reasons. They're obviously, they're a place where um, you can borrow books, which is what um, I often do with my kids. Um, but they uh, are also places where people can um, go and talk to someone who, you know, don't often get an opportunity to speak to someone there. They're a place where you can go and find um, uh, music or, or uh, film that is difficult to find uh, elsewhere. There are places where you can um, 
uh, you know, gather with other people using a community room. Um, you can do research there. There's so many different um, ways uh, to engage with our libraries and uh, we need to be supporting that as well as um, looking at the new ways that people are engaging with libraries all over the world uh, as a way to build community and help people learn. Um, and uh, this is uh, hopefully going to set us on the path to achieving just that. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Sirikoff, did you have an amendment you would like to propose? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Yes, I would like to make an amendment, please. Hey, would you just read out the, um, the amended section, the section in red for us once we get it up, please? Okay. okay. Now, ready? Yes, please. Okay. That would be great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, so I'd like to um, make the amendment uh, 3.3 .3 of endorses the continued investment in hard copy and digital books for adults, adults and children as part of a collection that responds to the diverse and emerging needs of the Port Phillip community. Right. And also uh, 3.4, um, that officers prepare a timeline for implementation of the Library Action Plan for report back to Council by Nova, November 2021. Do I have a seconder? Oh, I've got Councillor Martin to second. Okay, so Councillor Sirikoff, would you like to speak to your amendment? Yes, thank you. Um, the uh, the, the uh, Library Action Plan is about repositioning the needs of Port Phillip libraries by creating uh, dynamic and culturally diverse, diverse environments. Um, this is a great thing for a changing world and the changing needs of the community. Um, it is encouraging to read in the report that libraries as they currently operate, have a customer satisfaction of close to 100%, and we must make we need to maintain that level of satisfactions as libraries change. My reading of the feedback in the community consultation report and residents' emails is still an emphasis on the uh, core it, it, that the core or central purpose of a library is books literacy and learning, no matter what other enhancements are happening. Also, many people are in favour of um, revitalising our, our libraries, but also want assurance that hard copy and digital books will not be overlooked with the changing face of the libraries. Um, and this is why I raised this amendment as an assurance to book lovers, both young and old, and the book clubs across Port Phillip in all the suburbs, of the ongoing investment in books. And, uh, and this is alongside the timelines of the how the libraries will be changing as, as described in the library action plan. So for transparency, after a long a fantastic long consultation and thorough consultation with the community, the community is I see as being um, eager and just wants to know how and when their libraries will be changing. So I hope that um, Councillors will support the, this amendment. Thank you, uh, Councillor Martin. I will be speaking in favour of the Library Action Plan by Council because I've, I've, I've seconded the amendment as well. I think it's a great Library Action Plan, and I think that what Council Sirikoff was moving is inferred in that Action Plan. I don't think what's in this amendment is actually making a substantial alteration to the to the Library Action Plan, but it's making it a little bit clearer that we as a council have a really strong commitment to hard copy and digital books and that we really want to make sure that our collection does respond to the diverse and emerging needs of our community. And as someone who's been in education for 48 years and working in school libraries for 48 years, I think I understand better than most the importance of libraries as for a whole range of reasons. And the Library Action Plan talks about many of them, but the core business is to have those hard copy and digital books. So, it's there already, but thank you, Councillor Sirikov. I think we're making it very clear that this is a feature of our library action plan. And secondly, it's giving a gentle reminder to us all that there are lots of really fantastic recommendations in the library action plan, but yes, a timeline so we've got a better idea of how they're going to be implemented would be fantastic. So thank you, Councillor Sirikov, for moving this amendment. Uh, Councillor Bond, do you want to speak to the amendment or the substantive? Uh, the substantive, thank you. Okay, would anyone else like to speak to the amendment? 
uh, if not, we'll put that to the vote. Councillor uh, Tirokov, did you? No, we don't need to go to that. Um, all right, let's go to the vote on this one by division. Um, I'm going to go for Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. So that amendment now becomes part of the substantive uh, motion. So Councillor Bond, would you like to speak to the substantive motion? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. The forward, forward to this um, library action plan was a proposal to remove books from the, the Middle Park Library. And hopefully tonight we um, conclude the final chapter on that proposal by sending a very, very clear message to our community that the Middle Park Library is around to stay, that, that books are going to remain in the Middle Park Library and that books generally are a very, very, very um, large part of our City of Port Phillip libraries moving forward. And this, I think, amendment from Councillor Sirikoff, even though I, I believe it was already um, in the Library Action Plan, this makes it very clear that hard copy books in our libraries um, that people can physically borrow will remain across all of Port Phillip, including Middle Park, for a very, very long time into the future. Keeps oh, yes. yeah. automatically muting me. Sorry, guys. Um, there we go. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? No, I, I might close then briefly. Look, I think I remember the joy of being a kid and going to the library because, you know, I could never, we could never afford to buy that many books. And I used to get 10 at a time and we'd go every couple of weeks. Uh, social media has mean, meant I've become less of a reader and I think I need to reverse that habit, how much better for the, the mind and soul. But I do think our libraries have not improvement as much as enhancement. There is so much opportunity to explore in the way that libraries have become and the buildings and the spaces. You know, we do need places for people to go maybe in hot weather. We do need places where there's more interactive um, programming, um, some uplift to the buildings and a whole lot of things like that. So I'm really excited that we finally got to this point and looking forward to the opportunities, which I think the in the end what is what it was all about. Uh, rather than taking anything away. It was about looking at what the opportunities for the future are. So let's put that to the vote. I'll go again in the same order. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. The motion is carried. Moving on to 14.1, which is the intention to sell 174 Knott Street, Port Melbourne, the reporting of submissions in response to public notice. Councillors, do we have any questions for officers? No questions for officers? If not, do I have, a, we have an officer's recommendation, do I have a mover or something different? Uh, Councillor Pearl to move, do I have a seconder? Councillor Martin, Councillor Pearl. No, nothing from me, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councillor Martin. Fully support the officer's recommendation. Anyone else like to speak to the motion? Uh, Councillor Pearl, would you like to close? No, thanks, Madam Mayor. Let's put that to the vote. Uh, Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Against. Councillor Clark. Mm -hmm. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. That motion is carried. So now we are going to item 14.2, which is the 2021 mayoral and councillor allowances review the adoption. 
Now there was a, a late and further public submission that was received from a resident from Elwood and circulated to councillors. Councillors, do we have any questions for the officers on this report? I might take up the question posed by the late submission. Uh, it indicated that we receive a salary and an allowance. Could we clarify that for, for residents? That what is it that councillors receive for their hard work? Uh, through you, Mayor, uh, councillors are not considered employees of the council and do not receive employment benefits such as a salary or leave entitlements. Instead, councillors receive an allowance to assist in their role, representing and advocating for the community. And, and can I also ask a follow-up question? So in the amounts that are nominated, that, that we are still required to take out tax and our own super from the amounts? Uh, through you, Mayor, the um, tax is uh, required to be taken out. Um, the mayoral and councillor allowances are subject to the addition of the equivalent of the superannuation guarantee. That's currently 9.5%. This guarantee is scheduled to increase to 10% from the 1st of July, 2021. Thank you. Question um, from Councillor Pearl. Thank you, Madam Mayor. My question is in relation to that topic there. But just so I'm clear in the motion 3.2, it says $31,000 for the council allowance, 31,444 um, plus 9.5%. So is that on top of the 31,444 or inclusive of? Uh, through you, Med, that is um, on top of. So it is the 31,444 plus a 9.5% being the equivalent of the superannuation guarantee. Thank you for the clarification. Any other questions? Uh, Council Pell to move, do we have a seconder? Councillor Martin, Council Pearl. Um, just to say, where, what, what am I gonna say? This? A total over the four years, I think, will be in excess of $1.5 million that ratepayers will serve, um, that will, will provide uh, councillors and the mayors and the deputy mayors, etc., over the term of council. Um, it's a significant investment that ratepayers uh, provide councillors um, for their time. So, what are we? 31, 444, multiplied by nine is 282,000 a year plus 70 for the mayor so that's um plus including that so it's 352 it's um a significant amount of money that ratepayers are investing obviously and councillors gratefully receive this money um and it's not a job that anyone does for monetary benefit um well i hope we don't but we generally do it out of the goodness of our heart and to serve our local community so we graciously accept the amount of money that's offered, which is at the top of the band, the highest amount possibly allowable from the state government. Uh, and we understand that it's a significant investment that ratepayers are providing councillors to provide the public service that we provide you. So I'm uh, happy to move the motion and um, don't think that we're providing ourselves a big pay rise here or anything. These numbers are determined by the uh, state government and go through a very fair and independent process to determine them. Uh, Councillor Martin. Madam Mayor, having spent, well, I'm going to say all of my life in Port I've certainly been in the city of Port Phillip since it was first formed and before that the city of St Kilda. I've known many councillors and I know the many, many hours of work that councillors well before us have put in. And I also know how hard all of the, uh, my eight council colleagues work. And I think if the public knew the amount of time that our councillors put into their council duties, they would probably think that they were getting um, councillors at a very, 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 um, I want to say cheap, that demeans what we're doing. Uh, if, the, if if we were in any other industry, the hourly rate we would be attracting to what we do, I'm sure would be very, very significantly higher. But as Councillor Pearl said, we don't do it for money, we do it for the people of Port Phillip. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Bond. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's, I think it's worth noting at this point in time that we are not getting a pay rise this year. Um, the state government, in their wisdom, have determined that we don't get a pay rise. And it's also worth noting that we'd probably be the only politicians in the state that won't get a pay rise this year. I think they've all done very nice for themselves. In fact, I think we're probably the only public servants um, in the state that don't get a pay rise. Everyone else, as far as I know, I could be wrong, but every other public servant in the state gets a pay rise this year. But the 700 or 670 odd councillors from across the state. So, yeah, worth noting that and putting it on the public record um, for those you people out there who think that we are somehow on huge salaries here in order to perform this role. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? I'll just add my two cents worth. I just wanted to say I know that we talk about a lot of uh, ratepayers' money, but I know that we actually are putting in way more hours than any monies that we are receiving reflect. And the contribution that councillors make uh, and invest back into our community is huge in terms of time, energy and thought. So I actually want to, um, I may come from a different point. I think it's probably the amount that is considered an allowance does not reflect actually um, the responsibility that we have undertaken. And, and I think that that, the investment that we make is what we should remember. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Pearl, would you like to close? I'm very happy to support this motion. If anyone feels like out there they're not getting value for money, just feel free to give me a phone call any time and I'm happy to take your feedback, but happy to support this motion here this evening. Let's put that to the vote. Uh, Councillor Sirikoff? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. Councillor Bond? Four. Councillor Clark? Four. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford? Four. Councillor Consolo? Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. That motion is carried. Okay, we're going to quickly move on to 14.3, which is the councillor expenses monthly reporting April 20 to 21. Now, councillors, I've been advised that due to an Optus billing system upgrade, incorrect data migration has resulted in billing discrepancies. Uh, data SIMs, including some previously cancelled SIM cards, have been incorrectly allocated. Now, this is been rectified and received a credit from Optus. The monthly councillor expense reports have been updated to reflect this change and will be republished on the website. So do we have any questions of the officers? No questions. Uh, and I can see that Councillor Pearl is wanting to move uh, with an amendment. So Councillor Pearl. If I could, Pearl. Madam Mayor, if the officers would be kind enough to bring the amendment up, could I just... Uh... Unless you can bring it, unless I can beat you to it. Sorry, my can you read that? Can you see that to read it out? Oh, here we go. That'd be great. So happy to move 3.1, 3.2 in their entirety and add 3.3. Request officers consult with the Audit and Risk Committee and undertake benchmarking against other Victorian councils on the childcare provisions in the councillor expense and support policy and prepare a briefing paper to councillors with any opportunities to increase the accessibility of childcare provisions in the policy. And I'm happy to second that. Councillor Pearl, would you like to speak? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Happy to move our monthly report, which details councillor expenses. Um, the 3.3 is to provide uh, off, well, direction to officers to produce councillors a report based on the new policy, which was adopted by Council in August 2020, pertaining to childcare references. Now, there was a significant investigation which cost ratepayers a substantial amount of money into a number of uh, expense claims um, in 20, majority of them 2018, 2019. As a response of that independent investigation, it was found um, and which resulted in um, a number of expenses being repaid that there were deficiencies particularly uh, which opened the council up to rorting in a number of areas and particularly childcare was one of them. That was in pertaining to the Audit and Risk Committee not being able to identify um, uh, invoices pertaining to um, childcare. Now, one of the issues with this is um, 
the recommendations which were adopted in the policy and accepted by council uh, was that the recommendations of the Oil and Risk Committee and that report are particularly onerous and onerous to a point that it's unreasonable, I think, for um, general councillors to go about their duties and actually claim under the policy, um, particularly some of the requirements in relation to childcare. So all of this amended motion does is request officers to go away, have a look at the way the policy that we adopted in August 2020 is operating from a practical point of view and suggest if there's any ways that potentially we can alter the components of childcare to make it more accessible so councillors can go about their work uh, and fairly reasonably, honestly and transparency claim uh, legitimate expenses uh, whilst they're going about their council duties. Um, simple as that. Put the motion to you, councillors. Okay, I am the seconder, so I, I will speak. Uh, I, I realised when looking at our expenses uh, on a monthly reporting, it occurred to me that um, even though we are eight months or seven months into our councillor term and many of our council lords have children that no one had claimed childcare expenses. And not because councillors haven't been busy and haven't, you know, had had probably um, challenges with, with looking after children and managing their schedules, um, the requirements for council. And looking into it, I realised that um, the bar is so high and I sought advice from pre uh, past councillors um, ab about not having children myself, about the process of, of getting uh, people to look after your children at last minute, what the processes were, what was required. And, and I realised that it, it really was um, not ideal. And we, we'd made the hoops so many to jump through that it was kind of prohibitive. So rather than the, the point of these allowances, expenses, sorry, um, is to support councillors in their role, we were actually making them so cumbersome and difficult. So I, I mentioned this to Councillor Paul yesterday, and so that's the amendment, which is a, which is a good one. So I'm looking forward to finding that middle ground where we ensure transparency and accountability, but we actually also uh, look at making it doable in a busy life so that people that genuinely need the support get it. And also maybe to putting bed some of the toxicity that has been around this. Um, so I'm looking forward to a, a much more balanced way of moving forward on this. Uh, Councillor Martin. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think we're blessed to have a number of our councillors who do have young children. I think it makes sure that our council is as representative as possible of the people of Port Phillip. I'm also, as you said, I'm aware that our councillors have been a little reluctant to claim childcare because the provisions that have been set up are, as I think Councillor Pearl said, rather onerous. We need to do everything we can to encourage people with young children to come onto our council so we've got a broad and representative council. We need to make sure that those members of council who currently have children are also able to fulfil their council duties without feeling that they're letting their kids down. So I think Councillor Pearl's amendment and the motion itself is an excellent one and I commend it to you. Uh, Councillor Sirakop, do you have a, a clarifying question? Yes, thank you. Um, so this is just uh, going back to the council officers for advice on the way that things can be done alternatively and what kind of alterations was Councillor Pearl referring to? I think it's to find all of that out, but let me check with officers. Carly Bennett's perhaps or? Uh, through you, Mayor. So, uh, it's from from what I can uh, take from the recommendation, if passed by council, is that we would consult with the Audit and Risk Committee. We would also look at um, the policies and processes used at other councils. We would then uh, come back to a, a provide a report. Uh, probably through briefing to uh, council and then also to the audit committee and in the event that council wished to make uh, any changes to its current policy, we would bring that back informally to uh, the council chamber for councillors to make a decision on. But this provides uh, officers with clear direction around the preparation of a, a benchmarking report and further discussion with councillors. Mm -hmm. Uh, Councillor Baxter. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, I think that it's uh, I think that it's good that we'll 
uh, be looking at opportunities to increase the accessibility of childcare provisions in the policy. Um, and I note also that no councillors have made any childcare claims. Um, what I would say though is that the biggest barrier to claiming uh, legitimate childcare expenses in in uh, the, the duties of a councillor um, is not necessarily the how onerous the process is, but um, the political hatchet job that has been done on councillors when they have claimed uh, for childcare expenses under the policy, um, correctly under the policy, um, uh, which uh, the audit report that Councillor Pearl mentioned uh, has found. Um, why, why would someone put themselves through that? Why, why would they, um, uh, you know, when, when you've got councillors who enthusiastically participated in the campaign against councillors who were making legitimate childcare claims, my question would be, um, no matter how uh, accessible we make the policy, there is a political problem here where councillors who need uh, childcare in order to go and um, do their duties have to constantly fear whether they will be made uh, a target for doing that um, because of other political considerations that uh, that might be out there. So while I'd be happy to support this, um, I want to keep in mind that that does not remove all the barriers. There will still be councillors, not just in this council, but in other councils, who will never claim legitimate expenses, childcare expenses, because they will be afraid of what will happen because we've seen what has happened. Councillor Bond. Yeah, it's probably an appropriate time to review the policy um, as it is a, a new council. The current policy, of course, was um, put in place as a result of the widespread warping of our councillor expenses that occurred in the previous council. Um, so Councilor far, Bond, that hasn't I, occurred uh, in... Councillor Bond, I will ask you to keep to the facts. That's not what the Audit and Risk Committee found. I think they are the facts, but anyway, I'll move on. Um, it's probably an appropriate time to review um, this policy. Um, it probably was a little bit tough at the time, but you know, certainly it was it was needed given the circumstances that the previous council found itself under. So happy to support this uh, amended motion from Councillor Pearl. Can I make a um, sorry, uh, Madam Mayor, just a point of order. Mm -hmm. What's the? You need to quote the number and, and what's it referring to? Yeah, so I don't I don't uh, have the number in, in front of me. It's a it's a derogatory and, inf and incorrect statement. So um, I might need to seek advice. From, I need to maybe seek advice on this. Mm -hmm. Have to have a number. Yeah, that's why I'm seeking advice for it. Please, Councillor Clark, if anyone else could stay out of it while I seek advice. Three, Madam Mayor. Three, Madam Mayor. Yes, the peers can help, but uh, Councillor Baxter would need, under our rules, to name the uh, governance rule which is he's claiming has been breached. At this point. Um, Councillor Baxter, do you have that in front of you? Or... Not, a, not in my home setup, no. So I okay. guess we'll just have to let that go through to the keeper. But I will, I will ask everyone to keep um, be clear um, uh, and careful with their wording please, for, for, as we go forward. Councillor Clark. Um, so I know what the other uh, councillors have commented on and you know, at the end of the day, the childcare, uh, the, it is an expense that councillors can claim on if they need to. So I don't think anyone should feel um, concerned or worried about claiming it. Um, I'm, the reason that this policy was put into place came about because of the irregularity um, that were found. And I think that, you know, the governance structure around childcare expenses is there for a reason. Uh, and while I'm open to supporting this and seeing what comes back, um, I'll be, you know, reserve my right to see what changes are proposed that um, potentially don't open us up to any further potential um, irregularities, which is not to suggest anyone would, but we can't um, ignore the fact that we are required to ensure good governance around that. And it's not saying that any changes wouldn't be good governance either, but um, I just think 
um, this was put in place because of the things that happened in the past. Let's see what they come back with. Um, and, um, and then we can see whether there's any need to move any changes to this policy. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak to the motion? Can't see anyone. Um, all right, we'll go back to Councillor Pearl to close. Thanks very much. So th this policy should be about being fair, reasonably, reasonable, open and transparent about legitimate expenses that councillors have that they should be able to easily evidence that they've incurred um, and easily get refunded. I'm a bit disappointed, Councillor Baxter's comments around the uh, politics component of, uh, of it. And I do um, take that on. Sorry, Madam Mayor. Yep, no, continue. Yeah, I'm disappointed by Councillor Baxter's comments in relation to the politicisation of the, of the issue. And I think some of that's been um, fueled and played out here this evening. I think I was one of the largest claimants of that benefit or expense benefit in the previous council. Um, and I had no qualms transparently going on uh, radio and explaining why I had incurred those costs and um, um, transparently disclosing all of that material to the audit review that happened and also uh, any constituent that wanted to actually see it. And that's the sort of transparency and trust that we need in a policy to ensure that these expenses are legitimately incurred um, and legitimately expent so ratepayers can refund them. When we have those systems and processes in place, which I think um, we do pretty much across the board now based on the excellent review that was undertaken um, last year and adopted by council and the findings of that review. Um, the issue is that I think the pendulum is probably on this individual one swung a little bit too far and doesn't meet the realities of what actually happens from a practical point of view. Um, I don't think any, you have to be a low life to uh, a low life councillor, I would call it, which is probably a, a bit aggressive, but I'll, I'll say it to politically out somebody that is a legitimately claiming expenses um, and is able to justify those expenses. Um, I don't think any ratepayer out there, um, reasonable ratepayer out there, would expect people to fully cover all of their costs attached with their duties as a councillor. And so long as they meet the policy um, and they're done in a transparent, fair, reasonable and honest way, um, nobody should have anything to worry about. Uh, and any instances of people trying to politicise things uh, should be dealt with severely by the mayor and their fellow councillors uh, as we go down this route. So hopefully we get a good quality briefing. Again, it's a briefing. It's not a, a report back to council. It's a briefing. So councillors will consider this. And hopefully we can come up and inform a policy environment that um, meets everybody's needs and requirements and comes up with a practical point of view to um, move this um, policy forward again. So hopefully you vote for this amended motion. I look forward to holding everyone to account then in the future. Okay, let's put that to the vote. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford, four. Councillor Consolo? Four. Councillor Martin? Four. Councillor Pearl? Councillor Pearl? In favour, sorry, pardon me. Yep, Councillor Sirikov. Yeah, I'll do a big yes for this. Great. That motion is carried. All right, let's keep it moving. 14.4. The status of council decisions and questions taken on notice uh, recorded by council from 24th of October 2020 to the 31st of March. Do we have any questions for the officers? No, uh, then we, uh, we have a mover and uh, I have got Councillor Pearl to move and Councillor Copsey to second. Councillor Pearl. No, thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Copsey. Councillor Copsey, I can't hear you. Oh, no, thanks. Yeah, thanks. sorry, I just want to double check. Uh, would anyone else like to speak to the motion? If not, Councillor Pell, do you want to close? No, thanks, Madam Mayor. Let's put that to the vote then. We have Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikov. Four. 
Councillor Baxter. Oh. Okay, that motion is carried. Let's move on to 14.5, which is the City of Port Phillip Strategic Memberships Review 2021. So um, just to let you know, due to the complexity of this item, we will con consider this recommendation in three parts once I find my piece of paper. But do we have any questions for the officers? Do we have any questions for the officers? No, no, well, that, let me talk you through then the three parts that we're going to move it under. So the part one is that if we could get that up, please. Um, yeah, so that goes from 3.1 down to 3.2, which includes uh, maintaining the membership of South East Council uh, Seckers for one year. So that will be part one. Uh, and then part two will be the membership com committee for Melbourne. And then part three will be about the VLGA. So let's do part one. Do I have a mover and a seconder? All right. Uh, I might go. Uh, I'm. I, I will be moving it, and Councillor Copsey will be seconding. Seconding it. Uh, I will reserve my right, Councillor Copsey. I'll just speak to thank um, the members of some of the um, listed entities who came to speak to us tonight. Certainly, this council seeks um, to advance through partnership and collaboration. Uh, where we can. We know that across local government, many of us are tackling similar issues um, and there's a lot of commonality uh, and that we can achieve a lot more when we collaborate and speak as one uh, in advocacy and also in helping to undertake common work. So thank you very much to all of these membership organisations from which Council derives value and I'm pleased to support the recommendation in relation to these. Would anyone else like to speak to part one? If not, uh, I will close. Yeah, look, there's, there's so much benefit that comes from many of our partnerships. And, and I know myself personally, um, some of the organisations and then some I have not um, participated as much in, but I am looking forward to what might be possible with these organisations over this term. So let's put that to the vote. Uh, Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. Four. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Against. But uh, part one is carried. If we could get part two up oh, which is a uh so this is part two uh which does not renew membership of the committee for melbourne um i i will i will allow questions are there any further questions for officers before we i look for a mover of this or something different no questions all right uh i'm looking for a mover of this or something different I will move an amendment. Um, if I could get that up, thank you. So it may, uh, part two, three point three reads: maintains its membership of the committee for Melbourne at the foundation level on a condition of fifty percent reduced membership fee for twenty twenty one twenty two. And I have a seconder, which is Councillor Consolo. Uh, I will briefly speak to this amendment. The bottom line is. Relationships drive the world, as do volunteers, but that's a whole other story. Uh, and I really think that the Committee of Melbourne has a broad membership that we don't actually have in many of our other committees. They are much more council focused and not as broad as what the Committee of Melbourne uh, provides. Uh, not only is it educative, it is about networking, uh, driving forward some really big agenda items like fishermen's bend uh, and and you know urban greening and and a whole lot of things like that. And I, I just think that. A new council that'd be a great opportunity to see what you could access as new councillors, but also what we could, this next year brings. And I think partnership and collaboration in a, a world that is not even, I don't know how far we are through COVID, we've got a lot of recovery and I think we all need to work together. So I, I will be asking you to support this amendment. Councillor Consolo. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have a better understanding of the committee from Melbourne than we first discussed in our recent membership review. 
and therefore I'm seconding this motion tonight. The advocacy, uh, the advocacy around public transportation and fishermen's bend is really important to me, as are other topics by the committee for Melbourne. I know that there is overlap of topics by several of our memberships. However, each approach may be necessary. It's my promise to ratepayers that I will actively use these memberships next financial year to better inform myself for our annual review next year so that it isn't just money out the door like a gym membership might be to some. <laughs> That's a very good, <laughs> sorry, recommend um, uh, analogy. Would anyone else like to speak to the amendment? No, then let's, oh, Council Pearl. Yeah, thanks, Madam Mayor. I, I'm gonna um, speak against this motion. I, I, I like the promises of involvement. I've heard it several times, but what I'd like to see is results. And I think the Committee for Melbourne is a fantastic organisation um, and does some amazing things, but it's, it's predominantly focused as it should be on the, the city of Melbourne. I read, uh, I went to their website today and um, there's no reference to Fisherman's Bend in their strategic Melbourne 4.0 document. There's the only reference to Fisherman's Bend on their website was an event that Toyota held in March 2020 or thereabouts, which was a forum on Fisherman's Bend, which was uh, very interesting, but didn't. Um, didn't result in any practical action. So there's, albeit this is a small amount of money now, um, we've been debating this motion now for three or four years, and I, I think it's always been fairly close, but it's, um, it's an organisation I haven't actually seen any benefit from. And if we're looking to get access to certain people, et cetera, uh, effectively trying to get sort of a lobbyist type of arrangement out of, out, out of this um, organisation, we need a few things. And this is what we need. Firstly, we need a formal statement from the city, uh, sorry, the council committee for Melbourne around what their advocacy priorities actually are for Fisherman's Men. Not that they support Fisherman's Men, but what their prioritisation is and how it aligns with council. And secondly, we need them to prioritise that also um, and assist us with our lobbying, particularly around the tram and train networks in the Fisherman's Men on a formal point of view, not just facilitating them from a formal point of view. Um, if we get those two actions done by the end of the year, I'd say our seven and a half thousand dollar investment has been worthwhile. Um, invitations to events and all those sorts of things, we can get those without having to pay the seven and a half thousand dollars. So uh, I, I don't see value in this membership based on the results I've seen in the last three years and where the strategic settings for the committee for Melbourne are. Obviously, they've got a massive job ahead of them. And I think they've done a good job, particularly with their recent advertising. Uh, campaign that was put together by some of their founding mem members, including CUD, et cetera, and a number of advertising organisations. Uh, but the City of Melbourne, frankly, faces substantial more challenges in the next um, post-COVID phase than probably any other min uh, municipal council does in, uh, you know, really Victoria or Australia even. And the Committee of Melbourne over its history, decades of history, has um, shown real impact and been able to um, gathering and canvas businesses together and uh, bridge the, div the divide between the local council, the state government, and to a lesser extent also the federal government. So they do a great job, um, but I think they should you know, focus on the, their plans as detailed in their Melbourne 4.0 document. Um, and I don't think we need to be subsidising that. Uh, Councillor Clark. And so this was uh, an opportunity to save money. Um, through the review of the memberships that we did. And um, so it's really disappointing to see, once again, this being brought back. Um, we've got hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in relationships from the previous motion that we approved, some like SECA, which cost ratepayers over $40,000 a year. Um, so um, I think we can find a lot of relationships that we can work on from the previous list of memberships that we had. Um, you know, motions like this, I think, uh, for me, uh, don't provide us with enough of a focus on the ratepayers' precious funds. Uh, and this is somewhat um, of a painless way that we could have tried to provide some value um, for ratepayers and by not spending this money. And, and it doesn't impact services as well. So to me, um, trimming the memberships uh, would have been um, a helpful part of our budget review. So I won't be supporting this motion. Councillor Bond. Um, I'll flag that in the event this motion fails, I will um, put up the original officer's uh, recommendation. 
That's it, then, Councillor Bond? That's it. Councillor Martin. I'd just like to thank, to thank Councillor Pearl for his very clear, concise explanation about what the, the, the community of Melbourne should be doing in Fisherman's Bend. I also believe you only get it out of something what you put into it. And if we're, be, if we're for seven and a half thousand dollars, a 50% discount, we're able to help the committee of Melbourne deliver all those things that Councillor Bond has spoken about. And that will be up to us to make sure that we can help drive that. I think it's a very, very good investment in the short term. And if some of Councillor Pearl's um, red flags that he doesn't believe in the past we've had value for money for, if we can't get what we want out of it this year, I'd probably be supporting his motion that we don't re rejoin in 12 months time. But given the potential for movement on Fisherman's Bend through the, through the Committee of Melbourne, particularly with the advice that Councillor Pearl has given us, very happy to support this. Uh, anyone else would like to speak to part two? If not, I will just round back. Um, I, I, I just want to say that I know that from traders, particularly in St Kilda, they, they feel that they are struggling just as much as the city of Melbourne. And, and I think it is on us to uh, acknowledge that and, and look to opportunities where there may be collaboration with the city of Melbourne um, uh, in these opportunities. I think they are under just as huge stress uh, with international tourism closed as the city of Melbourne. I'm glad we can find those focuses as mentioned by Councillor Pearl and we can work closely if this should pass with the city of Melbourne to get those outcomes. But again, we all know how important fishermen's then tram and train are and it's going to take a lot of advocacy because there's a lot of money involved and we need commitment. And if that is one of the ways we can do it, I'm very happy to support that. Okay, let's put that to the vote. Uh, I'm going to go in the same order just because it helps my brain. So, Councillor Clark. Thank you. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. Against. Councillor Sirikoff. Against. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Against that uh, part two has carried. So moving on to part three, if we could get that up on the screen, please. Uh, so are there any questions of officers on this part of the motion? What's that question, Councillor Pearl 3.4? Sorry, I'm not clear on that, Councillor Pearl. What no, sorry. Did we do we itemise the last one? Did you do three point three, or you did the whole part? Just to clarify. Oh, I just did the whole part, part two. Sorry, as as a whole. That's fine. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yep. So part three includes. Uh, we have. So do I have no questions? Do I have? A, I've got a mover with an amendment, Councillor Copsey. Thank you. It's just to move 3.5.1 to maintain membership of the Victorian Local Government Governance Association. All right, would you? Do... Yep. And we have a seconder, which is Councillor Martin, Councillor Copsey. Thank you. Um, Self-explanatory, the VLGA does excellent work in terms of advocating for the local government as a sector, as well as um, personally, I found their trainings to be of a very high quality, as well as their networking events. Just want to take time to thank um, those uh, officers and board members who attended this evening to speak to some of the good work that the VLGA has been doing. Um, and I certainly, it's been a very, very busy start to this council term and I'm looking forward as we go um, past this, you know, sort of introductory period where we're getting all of our council plan and budget set. Uh, and hopefully as COVID starts to um, have less and less impact, I'm going to touch wood and say um, that we can, as a council, start to take advantage of some of the opportunities that are available to us through this membership. I've already been to a couple of excellent trainings so far on the new um, Gender Equity Act and the obligations for councils under that new framework. So um, some great work happening here and I'm very pleased to put this motion supporting the continued membership. Councillor Martin. 
I have to apologise to my council colleagues. I haven't been a particularly good councillor in my first eight months in council because I wasn't fully aware of all the benefits of being involved in the VLGA. And it's only in the last four weeks that I've started to realise what an important and effective group that it is. And I've possibly, it's become it's through the election campaign that the VLGA has been running with, with its own organisation. I've been able to speak to a number of colleagues and from other councils. The amount of networking I've been able to facilitate for myself and improve my own understanding of local government and have a far better understanding of their role in delivering all sorts of professional development activities to councillors. I'm a bit like St Paul on the road to Damascus. I've been converted and I'm now very enthusiastic that we maintain our membership of the VLGA. Great, and we're just noticing, uh, Councillor Copsey, it's uh, Governance Association, not Government. So we do need to, can we alter that? I did say governance. You did Where say governance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to speak to part three? No one? We'll go back to you to close, Councillor Copsey. Well, I did say one thing that I wanted to highlight for closing. Uh, it's just to also applaud the fantastic work that the VLGA has been doing in terms of. Um, boosting the participation of women in the local government sector. It's sorely uh, overdue progress in that area. And I know that it's been a real um, point of success and I wish them all the very best with that continued work. Our communities are best served when we've got um, people representing them that represent the diversity of our communities. So it's another great benefit that I just wanted to highlight in speaking to this. Thank you. Let's put that to the vote. Uh, Councillor Clark. Thank you. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. Against. Councillor Sirikoff. Against. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Against. Uh, that has carried. So, councillors, that's the end of our reports tonight. We um, have no notices of motion, but we will move on to item 16, which is reports by councillor delegates. Do we have any reports from delegates who wish to share some information with us and the wider community? No one's jumping at it. Okay, let's move on to urgent business. Councillors, do you have any items of urgent business? No? Uh, so we're moving on to confidential matters. We do have one confidential matter tonight, uh, which is 18.1, which is the JLT class action. So I now call on a councillor to move that the meeting be closed to members of the public to consider a confidential item. Just before you do that, Madam Mayor, I'll just declare a conflict on oh, yes, uh, thank you. that motion as well. Uh, misplaced the wording, but I'll just, um, just uh, Marcus Bill declare that in relation to item, uh, item 18.1, which is in relation to JLT, I have a conflict of interest through close association and I'll now remove myself from that. Thank you, Councillor Pearl. Uh, I believe Councillor Martin will move to close the meeting. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Consolo. I will now put the motion under division. Uh, Councillor Copsey. Oh. Councillor Crawford, four. Councillor Consolo, four. Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin, four. great, thank you. Councillor Pearl is gone. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. The motion is carried. So councillors will now conclude this open part of this meeting in WebEx and we'll move to Microsoft Teams to consider the confidential item. So I advise uh, the members of the public that as there are no further open items to be discussed, that's the conclusion of tonight's meeting if any of you are still listening. Thank you for joining us tonight and uh, I guess we'll do it all again next week for the